All right. Thanks so much, folks, for being here for our main event. We, before we do this debate, just want to do our normal housekeeping. If you just made it for this debate only, there's a restroom right across the hall, and we're going to do the pre- and post-debate poll via hands, just in terms of which side you find most persuasive. The reason we're doing this is because this conference is sponsored by Manifold, which is an online play money prediction market where you can predict anything, including all the debates from DebateCon 4. So if you're watching online, click on that Manifold link in the description box right now and predict who's going to be most persuasive in this debate. The objective criteria for deciding who is the most persuasive is we're using the in-person audience polls just by putting their hand up before and after the debate. So if you're fully neutral or you're like 50-50, you're like, ah, I can't decide. We just ask that you not vote. But if you think that Biden would be better for America's future, please put your hand up. <laughs> Ryan's just doing a quick count right now. And then it's just going to be a percentage change. So at the end of the debate, we'll do the same poll and we'll see if the same percentage of people would say Biden rather than Trump. So next we'll need, if you think that Trump would be better for America's future, would you slide your hand? Wow. <laughs> you got it. Thanks so much. And I want to give a quick word from Stephen, who's representing Manifold. Stephen, seriously, thank you so much for being with us tonight. I want to give you a chance just to share a little bit more about Manifold. Thanks again. Thank you for putting on this wonderful event. Um, hi, I'm Stephen Gruget. I'm one of the co-founders of Manifold. Manifold is a prediction, a play money prediction market platform. And what that means, you can come onto our site and create a play money betting market on any question from serious issues like the conflict in Gaza to the winner of the 2024 presidential election to silly things like whether your friends will be dating in a month, um, like what color dog you're going to get next, Ab you know, Absolutely anything. If you can think of the question, you can create it on Manifold and have your friends come and participate. It's a lot of fun, um, and I, I hope you enjoy the debate itself and the market on the debate. Thanks so much, Stephen. 100%. And with that, we're going to jump into this debate. Thanks so much, folks. And, Stephen, the floor is all yours. Um, wait, real quick. You emailed us a list of a bunch of questions. What That's is our opening statement? What do you want it to be about? Just the general topic? or Exactly. Okay. Maybe just like your top three reasons. Let's say your top three reasons. Sure, we'll, get a, sure, we'll go <laughs> do a few. Uh, what, do I have 30 minutes for this or how long? Because uh, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Uh, first of all, I would, like to, uh, uh, I would like to honor my debate partner, Sean, who has a, uh, uh, the unenviable position of defending the undefendable Donald Trump. <laughs> um, so I guess... Um, I'll focus on one area, although I imagine our talks will take us across a lot of different areas. Um, when we're looking for who would be a better president for the next term, uh, I think something that's important is to look for what are the things that the president can actually affect and what are the records of both of these presidents so far on the things they can claim to affect. Um, one of the areas that uh, I'm going to fix it heavily on, because this is an area where the president can take point, is going to be, of course, foreign policy. Uh, Trump's foreign policy in almost every single regard was an unmitigated disaster. Uh, the photo opportunities that he had with uh, North Korea, uh, the lack of concessions that he gave from them, the discomfort of our allies in the region as a result from that, uh, exiting us from the Iranian nuclear treaty that we are no longer allowed to re-enter, that we don't have any control over anymore uh, as Iran races towards nuclear weapons um, that we have completely lost all uh, oversight on. Uh, the obscuring of the number of drone strikes that we're doing, uh, as Trump has uh, sought under his administration to make it harder to see how many drone strikes were actually happening, and the fact that these drone strikes were still probably increasing or remaining the same under his administration, though it's hard to tell. Uh, the abandoning of allied forces in northern Syria, uh, the Kurdish people that we were working with to fight ISIS that he basically abandoned to Turkish attack. 
Um, the lack of any real agreement made with the Taliban, the fact that when he did those round of talks with the Taliban, the Afghanistani army was not present, the, or the Afghanistan army was not present, the idea that he kicked the can on the road, or he kicked the can down the road on those talks until the next administration so he wouldn't have to deal with it. Um, the, the fact that he says that he would be the one to solve the Ukrainian issue despite the fact that he did literally nothing about Russian occupation in Crimea. Uh, the fact that he was constantly antagonistic towards both of our neighbors, um, Canada and Mexico, and our neighbors afar. Uh, Angela Merkel famously saying that Europe can no longer look to the United States for leadership around the world. Uh, the fact that Trump undermined NATO, questioned why we were even in it, made it sound like the most important part was just individual countries contributing some military budget to it. Um, the fact that the parts of his foreign policy that were supposed to affect us economically sucked. Um, the tariff agreements with China were a disaster. Uh, everybody agrees at this point that it am amounted to, I think it was like a $72 billion tax that Americans ended up paying. And it didn't even target China in the way that we wanted it to, as opposed to, say, the CHIPS Act that Biden did that actually centered a lot of new uh, semiconductor manufacturing at home. Um, yeah, the, the, yeah, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do a foreign policy there, and then I'm sure we'll talk about other things like crime, domestic policy, and everything later, but I'll turn it over to Sean, see where he wants to go from there. Yeah, I, well, I'm glad you want to focus on what the president can actually impact, because as of right now, with split government and likely we're not going to have a president, at least for the full term, with both chambers of Congress, it really is down to what the president can impact. Now, it's interesting that you would lead with foreign policy, because one president that we're talking about actually had a guy that had to be stripped of security clearances due to the fact that he was loyal to Iran, which was uncovered in emails in a recent scandal. This, of course, is Rob Malley. And Rob Malley was only the head of our side of the negotiations for Iran. And it turns out he was recruited by the Iranians years ago and was advocating for them. So in that particular point, I'd rather have somebody rip up a deal than put in an agent for the other side as the person to negotiate a new deal. As far as what the president can impact, one of the big things that they can affect in our day-to-day -day lives is through the regulatory state. Now, Trump was actually the first real deregulator in American history. With just 20 regulations that he removed while he was president, just 20, the average American is estimated to have saved in terms of income $3,100. That's $3,100 in your pocket due to the fact that the Trump administration was using his executive power to pare down the regulatory state. This amounted to $220 billion in cost savings for consumers and for uh, businesses. By contrast, our buddy Joe Biden has added $360 billion in new regulations, big ticket regulations, and compliance for this. Just the paperwork is 220 million hours. If you think that that is not impacting you economically, you got another thing coming. And speaking of economic impact, many of our major cities in this country have to deal with a migration crisis. Now, one of these candidates, even though the wall didn't get built, let's be honest, campaigned on building a wall. The other candidate campaigned on having asylum seekers rush to the border. Now, here's the problem. I'm in favor of asylum. Everybody should be in favor of asylum. If people are in danger and all of that, we want to help people because we're kind and compassionate people. But the thing is, when you have migrants that know for a fact, and they're economic migrants, make no mistake about it, that they can go to a border agent, say the right words, and then be put into our asylum court system, that creates a giant backlog. It actually hurts our ability to help those who are legitimately seeking asylum, and this was encouraged by the Biden administration. By contrast, probably the best policy of any president related to immigration in the last 20 years, President Trump instituted a policy called Remain in Mexico. Now, the idea behind this was pretty straightforward. If you're saying I'm fleeing, let's say Venezuela, due to the fact that I feel like I'm being persecuted or whatever. Well, the route to Venice, from Venezuela to the United States goes through about eight different countries. Now, if you're afraid you're going to be killed or persecuted or whatever the reasons for asylum, there is no reason why you shouldn't stop and apply for asylum in each and every one of these policies. Even though it's called remain in Mexico, it just means apply for asylum in each country and then come to the United States after you're rejected. Because again, asylum is supposed to be about safety, not economic opportunity. Of course, the Biden administration didn't did not continue that policy. He encouraged people to flood to the border. And now we have about 7 million 
border crossings, according to the CBD data. A bunch of Republicans will tell you 8 million. You pick whichever number you want. It's not good. And we're suffering the consequences for that. Major cities in this country are having to pay to hotel these people. And what's Biden's response? He wants to fast track work permits, give these people a faster magnet to further draw them into the United States of America and prolong the crisis. I think the number one thing that a president needs to do is advocate for the citizens of this country. These people are by definition not that. And this is just one of the many reasons why Trump is a better candidate than Joe Biden. Also, Trump is alive. Joe Biden, we don't know. I've seen Weekend at Bernie's. I know you guys have seen it. And, you know, symbolically, Destiny's drinking Red Bull to build up the energy to talk about Joe Biden. Well, I have water because I don't need any hype. All right. We're, we're going to kick it into an open discussion. So uh, uh, I'd like to put it over to the other side to respond to some of what you just heard and get us into it. Yeah, I guess the most important determining factor for, I guess, Trump's future health is I guess how effective the U.S. healthcare system operates in federal prisons. I'm not entirely sure <laughs> what that looks like, but um, I guess we'll find out soon enough. Um, I'm going to be honest, I haven't even heard of the, the Rob Malley story with Iran. Um, that might be one, I guess, particular person. Is this a person that was pointed, appointed directly by Biden? Yes, or? he was the person negotiating the new nuclear deal <laughs> on behalf of America, even though he works for Iran. And by the way, there's other people that also have Iranian ties in that group. Sure, maybe Iranian ties. Do these people rise to the level of Donald Trump when he was running for election, literally choosing people like Paul Manafort, um, who was working as an unregistered foreign agent in Ukraine, or people like Flynn who were lying to the FBI in regards to context that they had uh, with people in Russia? D does it rise to that level of making those types of personal choices? Do you think Biden is choosing those people in particular? Or? I mean, first of all, Flynn is, was allowed to speak to uh, the Russians. He was an incoming uh, person who was going to be on national security. Manafort worked for the campaign. Should he, should he have registered as a foreign agent? Sure, and he was prosecuted for that. But again, we're talking about the person negotiating with an enemy nation on this nuclear deal that you seem to want to praise, but he works for the Iranians. Uh, so Flynn, and it's been stripped of all security clearances. Sure, so if Flynn was allowed to negotiate with the incoming, um, as an incoming part of the administration, I don't know why he lied to the FBI then about his conversations. Uh, maybe you should talk to him about that. I mean, it could be a perjury trap. Who knows? <laughs> I, I mean, I don't think anybody made him lie if you actually read through any of the testimony related to that. Um, is, do, you, do we think that, I'm curious, on a broad macro perspective, if we look at the approaches that the presidents have taken to foreign policy, do you think that Donald Trump was better at shoring up support for America uh, internationally, or do you think Joe Biden has done a better job for that? Well, there's, there's two things. There's one, there's like, oh, are you well-liked by like Angela Merkel and all these European leaders? And the, they're, on the flip side, you have something like the Trump administration sending more weapons to the Ukrainians than the Biden administration, and the Biden administration not realizing that Vladimir to the way he viewed Obama during the Crimea annexation as somebody who wouldn't do anything, which likely is one of the factors that played into his decision to invade Ukraine. So, like, yeah, the Trump, obviously, he talks like a goofball and all that, but he tends to appoint people to do the policies, and because he's not particularly interested in individual policies, he's more in interested in negotiating and, like, the whole process of being president, they tend to do a better job. Biden, on the other hand, is just not even awake. What if, um, if, if they thought that uh, Trump would do a better job at negotiating these policies, why is it that almost every single person in his administration that talked about doing foreign policy ended up shit-talking him? Um, I'm pretty sure Pence and the AG at the time had a lot of bad things to say about Trump in regards to North Korea, for instance. Do you think he handled North Korea appropriately? I mean, what, what went wrong so much in North Korea that we're even talking about? The it? fact that we validated him as a leader, we gave him photo opportunities, and we had talks with him without securing any sort of concessions whatsoever while telling the rest of the world that we were doing a good job in negotiating something with I him, mean, whatever that was. The question is, as compared to to what? So As compared to not talking to him and continuing to, uh, I guess, advertise on the world stage that until he's ready to come and have talks about cutting down their missiles program, cutting down their nuclear weapons program, uh, until they're ready to have those talks, they're not
not going to be as validated as, as I a, mean, but none of that worked on, for, I don't know, how many years since the Korean War with North Korea? Like, we're, we're on the third member of this freaking uh, hereditary dynasty? Sure, but I mean, now in the region, you've got Biden, who has better relations with Japan and South Korea, having talks about what to do with North Korea. When Donald Trump was in charge, we talked to Kimmy, we gave him some photos, and then we left. I mean, the, the South Koreans wanted to do a joint Olympics under the Moon government when Trump was president. So, like, he was also, like, mirroring, to a certain extent, the policies of the Moon government at the time. Okay, so then to be clear, you thought that Trump uh, having photo opportunities and legitimizing Kim as a leader without actually securing any concessions, with them continuing to race towards a nuclear program and continuing to test yeah, they already have They already have a nuclear program. See, yeah, but now the, they also have, like, the, now they the, have U.S. approval for what they're doing, essentially. Now it seems like the, the U.S. They don't have actual U.S. approval. You're they talking about, like, a perception of U.S. approval, which I don't think is, is granted. The idea that North Korea is an ally of the United States or anybody legitimately believes that is ridiculous. Remember, the way that this started is that Trump kept threatening Kim Jong-un over and over and over again to the point where they wanted to ask for a meeting because we tried this like posturing in the same way that we did for again since 1950 whenever the korean war had a ceasefire because it never technically ended and it didn't get us anywhere like now we actually had an opportunity we sent our best diplomat dennis rodman over there he plays some like dope basketball and you know like it is what it is yeah but what i don't know why we think that we did anything when this is, I'm pretty sure, the first time a North Korean leader is at a photo op, a handshake, and Jesus Christ, a fucking salute from our president. Um, I don't know why we just hand wave that and say he was trying something. He didn't try anything. All he wanted was, and this is going to be a theme for all of Trump's administration, the only thing he wanted was a photo op. That was it. Um, there was no diplomatic plan there. All we did was enrage or anger our allies in the region. And you can say that, who cares, it's just a photo op, but he's the president of the well, United who, States. Who's enraged by that? Again, the Moon government at the time was very friendly to North Korea. He crossed the DMZ zone during the Olympics. Like, remember they were hyping his sister sure, as I understand girl we have the boss Olympics. dictator in the media. Yeah, we have the Olympics story, but tensions at the time were not good because shortly after our meetings with Kim, they literally go right back to testing missiles. But that's missiles. what North Korea always does. Yeah, except now they've done it after getting photos for the first time with the U.S. president. All right, I mean, again, okay, this, is like, this is Do like this is like the most petty thing, maybe because you I don't mean, want to talk about Iranian spies in the Biden administration. Sure, I, d I don't even know if that claim is true, unfortunately. I've never even I mean, heard why of did, it. I mean, why did Rob Malley lose his security clearance? Well, I don't know. Why did he lose his security clearance? Because what is the... he was recruited by Iran well before he was in the Biden administration, along with other people, again, who are supposedly negotiating for our side on this nuclear deal. So you're saying he was working as an unregistered foreign agent or a spy? I, I don't know which one. We'll, well, if you're we'll wait, was, we'll if you're wait saying, for the shakeouts of potential indictments in the future. But well, how long? How long ago did he? This lose is, his, this how long is, ago did he lose his security? Clearance? This is recent. Like I think news of this broke. If I have uh, the date right here somewhere, I, I believe it was like last month or something like that. And what was the what was the reason why he lost the security clearance? Because he was tied deeply to Iran. We have emails from him and contacts in the Iranian government. And the perception of those emails, at least according to the reporting, is that he is still loyal to the Iranian government. Um, okay. Uh, it's interesting that he hasn't been charged with any crime. If it sounds like what you're talking, well, you're it's literally like a, it's describing... It's like a month. Like, it takes a, sometimes it takes a while. Yeah, to but why it. is any of this information public if there hasn't been a charge yet? Because we have media that, like, pursue stories and sometimes... And get leaks from the government about potential espionage investigations? That happens all the time. What do you mean? It doesn't happen all You're the talking time. about the Trump administration. I don't think, everything, um, everything was sure. leaked in the I don't Trump have information about that story. I don't think any of that story is true, but I guess all we'll right, find out. All right, if he says so, I mean, either, um, either, either he lost his security clearance or he didn't. Like, this is enough for Well, you can lose your security clearance for a variety of reasons. If you can lose a security clearance for not uh, declaring that you're friends or in a relationship, for instance, with somebody from a foreign country. Um, or you could lose a security clearance for a, a whole host of different reasons that don't involve actual espionage of the United States. Well, I didn't say, first of all, you brought up espionage. I didn't say he would be charged with espionage. Again, that came out of your mouth. I just told you what happened, and it's an ongoing developing story. Okay. Well, I think that the ongoing developing story of somebody losing a security clearance that was involved in Iranian nuclear, uh, or, or some sort of Iranian negotiations, I don't think is quite as bad as Donald Trump exiting us from the nuclear Iranian deal that was allowing us to keep tabs on their nuclear program. 
I mean, that deal was crap, and we had a very similar deal uh, with the North Koreans since you brought them up back in the 90s under Clinton, and obviously that did not prevent them from developing a nuclear weapon. You, I don't think we had a I deal with just, the North Koreans that allowed the United Nations into their nuclear facilities to do constant inspections I don't know to the, make sure. I don't know the specifics of the uh, North Korean deal, but like these kind of deals don't tend to work. You also had Ben wait, Rhodes. Wait, the, this deal was working for Iran. It literally was working. Yeah, it was working for Iran. That's the problem. It was working for the whole world because we were preventing Iran from approaching a nuclear weapons program. Mm, I totally disagree. Okay, the UN disagrees with you, but okay, that's fine. Um, uh, what do they know? Also, in terms of foreign policy, I mean, look at what is going on in the Middle East right now. Like, President Orangeman, you could say whatever you want about him, but he made it pretty clear that Israel is our ally after, I don't know, 20 presidents? I, that's an exaggeration. After four presidents promised that they were going to recognize that Jerusalem was the capital of Israel, Trump actually did it. And then, weirdly enough, even though we were told by the media for years that making peace between Israel and Palestine was the key to working out recognition and all these things with, uh, with the Arab world, it turns out that not doing that, standing firm with your ally, actually made that clear that that was off the table. And then we started to see recognition deals from these nations of Israel, our ally, during the Trump administration. And the wonder kid that everybody made fun of because he was put in charge of 25 million things, not my favorite person, Jared Kushner, actually did negotiate pretty well on behalf of our ally. Um, so I'm pretty sure Donald Trump moving the embassy to Jerusalem has been lauded as a catastrophic decision because he did it for literally no reason other than to antagonize the Palestinians in the region, which as we can see hasn't Wait, moved as Can I ask you a question? Where is the capital of the United States of America? DC. All right, and like, who decides that? I'm just curious. I, uh, sometime in the founding of our country, what do you mean? Who decides the, that? The United States of America would decide where their own capital is, right? Sure, yeah. So like if Canada didn't recognize that our capital was DC and they said it was, you know, like, uh, Ohio, is Canada like, currently like, occupied like, territory like from Like Cleveland the United or States? something? Like, sure. would, it, would it be weird if all, of our con if all of our allies recognized what Canada said? Or should they recognize what we declare our capital as? Because Israel has declared their capital as Jerusalem. Does this Canada, is about recognition Canada, of your ally. Yeah, does Canada And, like, that own, seems like a basic thing that you should honor. Does Canada own any part of Washington, D.C.? I don't know. Do, does Palestine own anything? Is it even a country? Okay. <laughs> So the, yeah, so the whole point of that is that it's contested territory. That's why recognizing Jerusalem as the capital is probably not a good idea because who even owns Jerusalem? It's a great idea because if you're aligned with the country and they're telling you this is their capital, you can either recognize it like you would for a country that you're aligned with or play this game where you're like, okay, we're all going to promise it and then not actually deliver on it. Do you think it's weird that Bill Clinton, George Herbert Walker Bush, George W. Bush, and Barack Obama all made this promise and never delivered? No, because the whole point of the capital of Jerusalem and moving the embassy to Jerusalem is that Jerusalem is partially uh, contested territory. That there's a huge issue about who actually owns which parts of Jerusalem that need to be resolved that the Trump administration didn't move us any closer to resolving before just smacking the embassy down in Jerusalem and saying, oh, look, we did a good thing. But all I, it did was increase tensions in the area. It didn't help anything. It didn't do anything good. That is like, true. The largest terrorist attack in Israeli history happened under the Trump administration. Oh, wait, that was last month under Biden. What, what did Biden do to increase uh, hostility? Between well, we do have an intelligence base over there. Why did that fail? I don't know what any of those things have to do. So part of the reasons why the people in the Gaza Strip are so incensed at people in Israel is partially because of, you brought these up, the Abraham Accords. Um, none of those bilateral peace agreements were impressive. They were already with countries that had had relatively normal relationships with Israel for uh, years. Um, they didn't involve any of the actual countries that have a lot of issues uh, with Israel, such as Jordan, such as Syria, such as Iran. And the only thing it did was continue to antagonize relations between Israel and Palestine because there were more peace treaties being signed in the Middle East without any explicit statement on what would be done because, with the contested territory. Because it is a myth that this Israel-Palestine thing is the key to recognition for the state of Israel amongst these countries. Once you take that off the table and then you start negotiating with these other nations directly, you have all these places that are, you are right, they were working with Israel like kind of under the table while pretending that they still didn't recognize them, but getting at least a few of them to start the process of coming forward and recognizing the nation is progress. 
And that did happen. Yeah, but it's progress in an area that doesn't matter, and it's making regressions in areas but that why do would, matter. But why would that not matter? It's it like doesn't the matter broader, because these countries like the were already... It's like the broader Middle East. Because these countries were already communicating with each other, more or less, and now all it's And by is, the way, one of the foundations of this alliance is the fact that Iran is a regional power that they're all trying to check in the area. So again, hostility towards Iran, trying to isolate them as a strategy, also ended up leading to this recognition. I'm sorry, just to be clear, you're telling me Saudi Arabia needed a bilateral peace agreement with Israel to fight with Iran? No, I'm saying that using their shared enemy rather than this conflict between Israel and Palestine as the entry point towards recognition is a better strategy. Yeah, but the conflict between Israel and Palestine is like one of the defining conflicts in the region. And Trump didn't move any closer towards that, and in a lot of ways hurt our ability to resolve it by aggressively acknowledging a capital and moving an embassy to a place in contested territory, and then in signing peace agreements without including the Palestinians in any of the talks. The same way that he did the Doha agreements but with why, the Taliban without including the Afghanistan government. But the same way that he agreed to pull out of Syria without uh, consulting any of the Kurdish people that were about to be mowed down by an invading Turkish force. But why would, again, I need to negotiate with the Palestinians to talk about this alliance that you're building against Iran? What, because the because Israel Palestine is like the contested territory. Yeah, in the that East is that a contested solved. territory. You realize that there can, you can walk and chew gum at the same time. They could have this issue, this border issue that is over here, but the main issue is that these countries are all natural enemies of Iran, and you're trying to build alliance to counterbalance that. No, you're like not. One has Nobody cares. To do with the We're other. not trying to build an alliance to, to counter Iran in the Middle East. That's just not... What are you talking about? Have you ever seen the map of, like, all the bases that we have surrounding Iran? How like, long have those why, bases existed? Is this why are the Cold trying to, War? Do you think why we're going to fight against Iran? Why are we, against the Soviet I Union. said counterbalance. Why are we trying to negotiate a nuclear deal even under the Biden administration with Iran if we're not trying to keep them in check? Because nuclear, like, anti-nuclear proliferation is one of, like, the stated goals of the entire world at the moment. So we try to discourage, essentially, everybody from approaching nuclear weapons. So you're position is that we're not trying to keep the Iranians in check as a foreign policy goal that transcends a bunch of different administrations. My position is that if we wanted to prevent Iran from approaching nuclear weapons, the best way to do that was through that joint plan of action, I mean, the Iranian nuclear deal that Donald Trump pulled nice us way out of. Not answering, actually, that's a nice way of not answering the question after you're saying that we're not trying to limit Iran. No, we, I don't think we're trying to build a coalition against Iran in the Middle East. What are you talking about? Of course we are. We're trying to have a check on Iranian expansion. Of course we are. Where is Iran expanding to? Well, right now they're expanding their influence into Iraq. Or do you deny that? That they have uh, a lot I of Iran influence and in the Iraq new Iraqi been, government? Yeah, but the way to do that is to build military alliances? Yes. Okay, I disagree. I mean, wait, I wait, wait, wait to hold on, hold on. Let me, let, how, how let me just, let me just with, ask you a question, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. So do you think as a strategy, I don't know, against, let me just make up a country that might like want to aggress, uh, as a strategy against like um, Russian aggression, that we could have an alliance like, uh, like a North American like alliance, like something like NATO, and that would be a check against Russian expansion in the future if you just align those countries militarily? Uh, NATO was created to counter the second world, not one the country. The second world, like multiverse, like what do you mean? In the Cold War, you have the First World, which oh, are the okay, Western yeah. Aligned Powers, and you have the Second World that are the Soviet Aligned Powers. Sorry, I was watching right? a movie so before the this. The Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact is what NATO was created to serve as a yeah, counterbalance Yeah, but it against. still exists, and we still admit new members as a counterbalance towards Russian aggression. Because Russian expansion West predates the Soviet Union. It's the whole history of the nation. Don't the reason we have that alliance there is, I mean, the original reason was keep Russia out and keep Germany down because we want to prevent conflict from breaking out on the European continent, because the last time that happened in a major way, well, the last two times, were two world wars. So yeah, you do build military alliances in specific regions to check an expanding power. Like, I don't, it seems like you're just arguing this to argue this. I'm not arguing to argue it. You're trying to make it sound like these random bilateral uh, peace agreements with countries that are already incredibly friendly towards us and pretty friendly towards Israel means but they never, they Why never... not work towards moving to normalizing relationships with Iran instead of being in intensely provocative towards them? They never, Wouldn't... they never formally like recognize Israel. What are you talking about? They were already communicating and a bunch and of these countries. More or less hitting, hitting, uh, in, a, in a bunch them. of these countries, even though they're allies with us and they're allies and we're allies with Israel, if you have an Israeli passport in your uh, in, uh, Israeli passport stamp in your passport, you couldn't even go like to both countries. This is one of the reasons why with the State Department, you have to get three different passports sometimes if you're traveling between this region. <clears throat>
But yeah, like, of course, I, I obviously... Think you, I think if the goal is to reduce tensions in the re region, then the goal should be the normalization of relationships with Iran. That has been, like, the, the key goal for foreign policy for probably the past 20 years, before but, or 20 or 30 years, before, before Bush identified Iran as the axis of evil. That was our goal. It was towards normalizing relationships with Iran. That was part of what the Iranian nuclear deal was for. It was, ex except... Uh, Okay. Sure. Um, except, except the Iranian nuclear deal emboldened the Iranians. It put them into a position where their neighbors ended up fearing them, and that and that ended up putting uh, setting up the impetus for this potential alliance. I, okay. Um, yeah, I just I think that um, I guess we won't get into the the Syrians or the Afghanistan uh, conflict or anything like that. But uh, yeah, I, mean, I look, think that the, time the and time again, I think that time Afga and time again, I think that um, Donald Trump pursued things that didn't matter. They gave him uh, they gave him I guess photo ops. Um, we got this every conservative touts this peace in the Middle East that didn't really I, I didn't happen say, at all. I didn't say peace in the uh, Middle East. I didn't East. say you did. I said that a lot of Trumples and a lot of these people talk about peace in the Middle East or the historic uh, importance of these peace agreements. Um, they aren't. They aren't that really. Obviously, as we see today, they didn't get us any closer towards normalizing relations with the people that matter, like Iran, like Syria, like Lebanon, like figuring out what was going on in Palestine. Um, obviously, the situation in Afghanistan, him, again, kicking the can down the road so we wouldn't have to deal with that in his administration with the Taliban was deployed. Um, abandoning our Kurdish allies in Syria after they helped us uh, eliminate ISIS, or in, at least in parts of Syria, and abandoning them to the Turkish army. That was deplorable. Um, not doing anything about Crimea and, and somehow pretending like he would have stopped. The uh, Crimea Putin happened from... in 2014. Who was president? Was that Trump? I'm sorry, did Russia pull all their troops out for the four years that Donald Trump was president? No, th but like that <laughs> so happened. Clearly, that didn't matter. That happened in 2014, <laughs> and the Trump administration was heavily arming the Ukrainians. Uh, like yeah, more it's been a so than the Obama administration. Sell, it's been a policy to sell them weapons, um, but yeah, what? he ramped that up. Even though people were saying that he well, was, he ramped that up. He also got impeached for threatening to take it away because they wouldn't do allegedly. investigations on it. Allegedly, well, allegedly. He was impeached for it. Listen, um, I heard that was a perfect phone call. I don't know what you're talking mm -hmm, about. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know uh, what. How, how you? So you're a crime guy. How do we do a law and order president? who's facing like four different sets of indictments in the country. Listen. <laughs> All I'm going to say is that if you think that any other president, if they had these alleged crimes waged against them, would be prosecuted in the same way, I, I, think, I think you would definitely be lying. The fact of the matter is they're prosecuting him because he's the orange man, and that is the only reason. Can you give me an example of which of the indictments are comparable to past crimes that you believe that presidents have committed that haven't been pursued? I mean, you could prosecute. So one of the things that they used was a, um, in, in Georgia, they try to use a RICO statue against President Trump. Now, you could have actually used that against all presidents. Ben Shapiro made this argument back in like 2010 as a way to deal with their administration as a group. But like nobody ever wanted to do that because presumably opening that can of worms on past administrations should set a precedent that you could do this to any successive administration. But President Joe Biden, even though he's asleep, decided to have his attorney general, his Justice Department, break those norms anyway. And now it's considered a potential standard going forward that when you leave office in the United States of America, the next guy can come in and prosecute you. Even the Obama on, wait, administration what, what the, didn't do the... that. Even the Obama administration didn't do that for the Bush administration. And by the way, the crimes that he was accused of were actually torture related, ordering it, covering it up, detaining people in Guantanamo Bay in violation of their civil rights without charges. And Obama, like, you know, you say what you want and whether you agree or disagree with this, he seemed to set a precedent that the Trump administration actually followed when they were in office, which was we don't look backward, we look forward. But Biden's like, nah, never mind. We're going to look backward for this particular guy. So, and yeah, so this firstly, is destructive to our entire process. So firstly, there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever that the DOJ is working underneath Biden. Um, or that Biden is ordering any of these investigations. Who, who there's, appointed Merrick Garland? There's no, who appoints the chair of the Federal Reserve? Do you think Biden sets the interest rates? Who appointed Merrick Garland? Why do you think the appointment is what the determines Federal the Reserve, policy? The Federal Reserve is a unique like institution in the United States of America that does not directly serve under the executive branch, so this is why they're not analogous. The Department of Justice is something that is directly under the auspices of the president.
So when Barr was contradicting direct statements that yeah, Donald he, Trump made, was Barr working under the direct he was order of under, Donald Trump? He was under the direct order of, pre of President Trump. I mean, one of the things that you could actually ding Trump for is that he didn't fire people enough. Like for some reason he wouldn't, <laughs> for some reason he wouldn't fire, he, he, it's true. Like a lot of these people just ended up quitting the administration. Like he didn't fire Anthony Fauci, he had every power to do so. He had every power to fire his own attorney general. Gotcha. So just as a matter of like recent historical record, the DOJ does not work under command of the president of the United States. Of course it um, does. That is a fantastic claim. Uh, I'd be curious if you could point to investigations where the president of the United States ordered the DOJ to begin investigating enemies of the president. The, you could, a president can order the DOJ We're to We're not examine asking it. the president. He could, theoretically, he could make that, or he could, theoretically, but to do so would be an unbelievable breach of norms, which unfortunately we became a bit accustomed to under Donald Trump. But the idea that the DOJ works at the behest as the personal prosecutorial every, body every, of the president to go in, to go after uh, uh, opponents of the this president, is, this is a, is like that's a, an insane claim. This and, is, and Biden himself has made contradictory statements, as though Garland has made contradictory statements, saying as much that these things do not happen. Yeah. It does not happen. There was no communication. This is like saying that if Pete Buttigieg Judge over at transportation says something that Biden disagrees with that Pete Buttigieg is not working for the Biden administration. Sure, you can say specific things and maybe the Trump administration as a whole believed in a greater separation between the DOJ and the administration proper. But it has been long it has been long precedent amongst especially Democratic administrations that there is a close relationship with their office and and uh, and the DOJ. I mean, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. was appointed as the AG under John F. Kennedy. Eric Holder was called Barack Obama's wingman. Barack Obama would speak about a particular case. William Barr was called Donald Trump's sword and shield. And in yeah. the end, he was one of his harshest critics. I'm, now, Again, you're, now, you're, now you're contradicting your say, point. I'm not, I'm, I'm not what My point is literally the, that the, the Attorney General and that the Department of Justice, especially in politically charged investigations, along with the rest of our intelligence community, is supposed to work with some level of separation. Otherwise, why would it have been a big deal for Donald Trump to pull in Comey and have conversations? Couldn't he just order the FBI to stop an investigation? Couldn't he just order the CIA, Christopher Wray, to, to not look into things? Of course not. The idea that these, all of our intelligence and all of these executive orgs work for the personal pleasure of the president, especially in regards to politically sensitive topics, especially in regards to investigations of himself or political opponents, is a fantastic idea. You can try to talk around that all you want, but it would be an unimaginable they breaching all... of norms. And anybody that understands any part of how the United States government works would instantly know that the idea that the executive prosecutorial body of the Department of Justice can work under the personal pleasure of the president of the United States, that's just an outrageous claim. So like claim. The, the trick that you're doing right now is you're saying personal pleasure when I said that they work under the office of the president. Like, don't think I didn't notice that shift you're not in the work, standard. You're not saying they work yes, under the office. You of, you're saying they under take the direction from. You yeah, said they you, take direction yes, from. You can, order, you can order a member of the Department of Justice. I believe Scalia, when they reviewed the special prosecutor statute, was talking about how you cannot create through the executive branch a position that is superior to the executive branch. Like, not only is what I'm saying the norm in America, yes, the president can fire his AG, FBI director, anybody you want to run down the list of executive offices, he can't fire them, for sure. But on top of that, it has been backed up by Supreme Court precedent. Like, Justice, uh, Justice Scalia, the late Scalia, his writings are clear. You can't, there is no office under the executive branch that is superior to the head of the executive branch, which is the president of the United States. Okay. These like, are this fun is like words, a basic, it's, like, it's civics basic. lesson right not now. Not only is it not a basic civics lesson, you are so dead wrong. This would be such an unbelievable breach of norms that it would, it would be the lead story, probably internationally, if it came out that the president of the United States was ordering the DOJ this to go and investigate. This happened rivals. under the Obama administration. <clears throat> He asked Eric Holder to look into the Ferguson case. He asked Eric Holder to review the Trayvon Martin case. Like, what are you talking about? L looking, these are not like the politically sensitive cases. Oh, of they're, the, they're not of politically the, sensitive. The, the like Ferguson riots. Of, of the investigation of political opponents. But if any of that information comes out, I could be wrong. Um, so you're telling me then that of all the indictments that have been released, with all the evidence detailing the numerous Trump wrongdoings, that all of these are, are they fabrications of the Biden DOJ? Are they not trustworthy? Is, I, is I didn't say that they're necessarily fabrications. Fabrications. I just pointed out that these are cases that would not be brought against somebody not named Donald Trump. Okay, like can you give me an example of somebody else that's held on to uh, secret records that have been specifically requested by the federal government for over a year that haven't been returned? I mean, there's a specific case on, for Bill Clinton under the courts where he was arguing about whether or not his recordings were Un, were uh, what you call it, were of a of a personal nature or a classified nature. The court actually ruled with the Clinton administration. 
Uh, there are there are instances where. Wait, do you think that's at all comparable to what we're talking about? There are. Well, that one has a Supreme Court case to back it up. I'm well, not asking. I'm asking if that's comparable. You're saying well, a personal right, voice recording he made that the argument. Well, but, whether no, no. That there was, was person, more. Like, there was more that there was more to what the Clintons had, but like the court ruled with them, so it's not comparable because that's already been adjudicated right well, now. Well, no, it's not comparable because a personal recording is not something that the executive is declared to be secret, top secret. Listen, or a lot of these classified documents exist in a weird gray area. Because no, they don't. They, yeah, it was they, crystal clear. It yeah, was they not do. Weird and and I'll, I'll explain why. Because the president no, can declassify anything that he wants. But he wasn't the president. I, he, took, he, I, he wasn't the no, president. No, no, he, he was the them. he was the president when he took them. This is why you end up with a weird problem. It's not a weird problem at he all. He took them when it's he took them when he had the right to do it. The uh, what you call the Secret Service set up Mar-a-Lago for these documents to be capable, uh, be a place where they could be stored. Wait, waiting no, for, they didn't. Yeah, they did when the, he was the president. They were not set up to indefinitely store. Classified material. I didn't material. say indefinitely. You're adding a qualifier. Well, no, no, that but I didn't the indefinite say. part because he was no longer president. That's yeah, the whole point. Uh, my point is, is that it's a weird situation where he's able to move these things because he's the president, but then he stopped being president. So then it's like, okay, now. Like, how do you adjudicate this? You adjudicate like, it incredibly we simple, the way that it always has been done for past we've presidents. We've never had a case like we this. We had. It happened with Obama, where after you are leaving office, the National Archives will do a check to see if documents are missing, if they if they need to make requests for stuff. And then afterwards, they make a request to the person leaving the White House. I'm pretty sure for Obama, they, there were a ton of boxes that were brought back. They do their little checks, and once they have everything, they leave. There's an official process for doing this. They gave Donald Trump over a year to comply with these orders, and he was explicitly moving things around, okay? Like an old grandma trying to hide her fucking cookies from like the grandkids coming over. He was like moving shit around in Mar-a-Lago to try to avoid, not only was he doing that, he was also telling, he was instructing his legal counsel to lie. If Donald Trump felt like he had the authority to declassify anything indefinitely into the future, which by the way, one, is so ridiculous, I know even you don't believe that, and two, isn't even true because there are certain things, like I'm pretty sure the um, the Department of Energy has strict rules about the declassification of no, no, nuclear, a, oh, nuclear secrets. There's a the declassification president, the process. The president cannot unilaterally, by his own ways, declassify nuclear secrets. So even if we, even if I did grant you everything else, which I wouldn't because it's absurd, he can't even declassify some of this. He didn't even have the authority to do it. Do I mean, you... the Department of Energy, first of all, again, works under the auspices of the president. But again, I was not making the point that they were all declassified. I meant that he can view and move classified documents. But we're distracting off the policy issue because you don't want to talk about the Biden administration policy because you don't want to talk about who would be a better president. Instead, you're talking about these indictments, which again, we'll wait for them to be adjudicated. Innocent until proven guilty. I think that the president has a natural right, a God-given right, to store classified documents in his bathroom, and we'll see how the courts <laughs> let that play out. Okay, we can move on from this. So just to be clear, you think that the president of the United States can violate every single agency that works under the executive branch at any point in time because they work underneath him. No, I so if there's a FDA policy, if he wants to shit in your food, if there is a policy with the DEA, if he wants to shit in a nuclear reactor, um, if there is a policy with with, with the with the literally D anything, he can do D whatever he wants. The because DEA they controls nuclear reactors? The Department of Energy, sorry. For the DEA, I guess shit in your joint, okay? You're telling me that you're telling me that the president of the United States at any point in time um, can, can violate any executive agency rule no, no. because he's the president and they exist underneath him. That's your stated. No, that, no. that's exactly what you said. I didn't said. say any. That's literally not what that I said. That is literally what you said. I you said, said these <laughs> agencies exist under him. So if he wants yeah, to so violate these can, standards, no, he no, can no. do it. He can fire people at these agencies like that is a fact. That's what I said. That's what we we're talking about. Then do you think he, he should can have done also that direct before? these agencies to the ex especially to the extent that he's covered by the law but of course he is not able to be subordinated by the agencies that exist under his own office Congress can hold him accountable because we have a separation of powers the Supreme Court can hold him accountable because we have a separation of powers okay that, it's just, okay so that's so you believe that the president has unlimited I believe in authority. I didn't despite say the fact that authority. Donald Trump, underneath any of the executive stuff, despite the fact that Donald Trump himself literally said, I could have he, declassified these, but I didn't, that's, he can still infinitely take, any president should be able to take whatever classified material they want and hold on to it into an I infinite amount of time. I didn't necessarily say that. I said, let's let the case be adjudicated and we'll see how it goes. And obviously no other president would be prosecuted for this. Well, I mean, but you can't give me a single example of a president making anything this, this flagrant of a, of a, 
breach of norms or of a violation of maintaining uh, an indefinite hold on classified information uh, that's being in, like requested back by federal agencies. No other president has done anything like these things. Um, but you're just saying for some reason, even though, for instance, we got a historic um, of, a, of a guy that's not even related to politics, Hunter Biden, I think, got a federal charge because he had an old video of himself doing drugs and owning a firearm. I don't, I don't know if that's like in the history of the United States, if anybody's caught a charge for something like that. You don't that. think anybody's gotten a charge for lying on a firearms uh, form when they fill it out to buy a firearm that they're not using drugs when wait, they actually wait, wait. were? Was that the claim that I just made? But that's what he's actually charged with. How do they know that he lied because on that form? Because you have to fill out this form. I understand right? how buying a firearm works. And he said that he wasn't using, he wasn't under the influence of any substance. You're going to tell me that no American has ever been charged for lying I'm on that form? I'm saying that the idea of finding videos that are five, ten years old. It was within the statute of limitations. And using the video, and using the video to say that, uh, oh my God, I think he lied on his, on his ATF form. That is, an, that is an incredible charge. That is an incredibly abnormal charge. That is something you would very, very rarely, if I don't know if I've and, ever heard of a case like that. And you can pretend that it's normal, but if you talk to any gun owner, the idea that the federal government is looking back on videos from 2012 to see if you lied on an ATF form, that is an incredibly political charge. Uh, that just would not normally be done. I mean, first of all, he got a sweetheart plea deal, number one, originally, and then people noticed it, so then they had to claw it back because it was so absurd, number one. Number what two- What was the sweetheart plea deal? Uh, About what? He had to plead to like a misdemeanor and he was going to skate on that charge. Because he owed back taxes, Yeah, but right? the firearm thing was attached to it, but they were going to dismiss that as a part of the plea deal for the tax. Because most people don't have people going through old videos to try to, de to determine if they lied on yep. an ATF form. That's just an Listen, that's I don't have every thing. case ever where people use video evidence to dis disprove something like this, but it's happened before. <laughs> like, I mean, if you say so, I can, people, okay. people will do video um, investigations to check if you're lying on your social se security disability. Like the idea that people haven't posted video evidence of their crimes and then later, years later, been indicted on something like that is absurd. And also we have a huge regulatory state, which by the way is being increased by the Biden administration, and people get dinged based on ticky tack violations and end up serving federal time for that all the time in this country. What are bad regulations that Biden has passed you disagree with? Uh, there's a ton of them. Like, first of all, like he's not letting uh, these permits go through for the oil drilling. He repealed, like Wait, I said. didn't Biden okay drilling on federal land? Wasn't that one of the yeah, more controversial can, things You can say I'm okaying it on federal land and then make the claim like he does that there's 4,000 unused permits. But then when you go through the details of it and you figure out that in order to drill for oil, you need an exploration permit. Then, by the way, only one out of every 10 maybe find something like that. It might even be a lower hit rate. Then you need a permit in order to like have your drilling plan. And then you need additional permits in order to extract and transport and all that. So he can say, oh, I approved it on federal lands to sound good and, and whatnot. But in reality, the But he didn't dismantle the entire regulatory body of drilling and transporting fossil fuels, something that is pretty no, no, sensitive he in ramped the United it, States. He I ramped mean, it up. What, I don't think he's made substantial. Are you telling me that before you didn't need a permit to, trans, uh, to nobody transport said, oil? Nobody said you didn't need a permit, but you he's slowing down the process of the permits with How additional regulations. How is that possible? Regulation. U.S. oil production is at record highs right now. We are more energy independent than we have been in the history of the United States. His approval of drilling on federal land has been historic because a lot of people on the left are mad at him for that. If you want to claim that there are other permit things in the way, I mean, like, yeah, there's a whole bunch of regulatory bullshit in the United States, but Biden didn't invent that. Listen, and I think, if anything, he's trying to work a bit against it as we've been struggling for energy independence from other countries. I completely disagree. He definitely has been limiting the drilling on, uh, he's definitely been limiting the drilling through this gumming up of the works of the permit system. This is why there was so much pressure on him. And this was specifically highlighted when gasoline prices were shooting up through the roof. Uh, yeah, I don't think that was because of Biden not allowing uh, people to, to drill. Why were people States? even discussing and trying to defend the permits if this wasn't about that? About about what? About which thing? Like, why were people even discussing the number of permits issued and the slowdown, and then by, the Biden administration was trying to defend it by saying, oh, there's 4,000 unused permits, which, by the way, for oil and natural gas. Like, why was that whole conversation even happening? Probably because this people wasn't that are trying, I don't think there was a legitimate conversation about that happening. I don't think people right now are having legitimate conversations about oil issues in the United States. Again, I'm, I'm pretty sure U.S. oil production is at his, historic highs at the moment. Um, the idea that this is an issue that we're running into, that we're not making enough permits, that uh, domestic drilling is down. Um, 
Um, if anything, I'm pretty sure the, the, the complaints have actually been, now that I remember, pretty sure the complaints have actually been the exact opposite, that a whole bunch of domestic oil firms have had the ability to increase their production of oil, but because they were worried that we came off peak oil and because they're worried we're going to hit another economic slump, they've actually been intentionally holding back on supply and production because they're worried that if they overproduce, they're going to drive themselves into lower profits and then when the next um, economic disaster happens, they're going to be completely fucked like they just got over COVID. That, those are the conversations that I remember hearing, that people were upset that domestic uh, production was down intentionally, despite the fact that firms had the ability to increase it. Does anybody else remember hearing these conversations? Am I crazy? Yeah, this sounds pretty made up, especially when you brought in the whole... <laughs> Okay, Especially right. when you brought the whole peak oil thing in, which was a nice little buzzword you toss in there. But a nice little pivot to like something abstract that really can't be fact-checked and all that. But the idea that when gas prices were through the roof, that oil companies were intentionally not drilling to profit off those higher prices basically flies in the face of any economic reality that you can fucking think of. Like, it's kind of absurd that you would make that argument. Now, granted, well, how does that are there some... The are there... OPEC literally themselves will raise and lower production depending upon yeah, what they want to do with oil prices. How does that fly in yeah, the face they would, of economic reality? Sure, they can do that. But the thing is, if you're a domestic oil producer in the United States of America, not subject to what is going on in OPEC, and you see those higher prices, the idea that you wouldn't, the way you profit is by increasing your production and selling at those higher prices. You like this, is, you, hold, you, this is basic economics. Higher no, hold, prices draw in more people to invest in that industry in order to produce it. No, first of all, you just gave the opposite take of basic economics, which is when prices are high, if you increase uh, production, prices will necessarily fall, which is what the oil companies yeah, were worried about. They already had all of the major capital investment. They were worried about another huge price slump because that's what had happened. And be, The way to you COVID profit off of higher prices is to sell at those higher prices. Yeah, but if you sell your entire stock and prices plummet again, you're not going to be prepared... I, I think we just have a factual disagreement on what the arguments were over. I mean, people can go and look into it. Um, I guess another anything thing that, to avoid talking about Biden's failed record. I see your strategy. Well, I, I mean, Biden's, if you call Biden's failed record, I'm curious if you call Trump's record. Um, uh, a stunning success. A stunning look, success. Yeah, we can talk about the big thing that uh, Trump ran on the wall. Why was Biden able to get a billion dollar concession from Mexico for investment into border security? And Donald Trump got a zero dollar investment from Mexico into border security. Listen, at some point in time, the the Trump administration during the USMCA deal decided that he was going to threaten harsher uh, negotiations against Mexico if they didn't send agents to their southern border in order to stop people from flowing into this country. The Almo government actually did do that. So even though they didn't say, here's a billion dollars for whatever, they still sent their people to guard their southern border because we all know what the strategy that they were doing. And by the way, Almo ran on the right of people in Latin America to immigrate to the United States, which is an interesting thing to run on, but whatever. It was to send his own soldiers down there. That was done by the Trump administration. That might not be this, oh, here's a billion dollars for like vague investment and whatever. It wasn't That's for vague actual investment. It was substantive for action right there. And maybe substantive action, something that Trump never managed to do. I mean, just look do. at the border crossings. Like, what has that billion dollars got us? We have 7 million, according to the CBB, the, his own agency, uh, saying that they cross into the United States under Biden's watch. That is way more Seven than Seven million. Hold on. What is your number? Seven million, Seven million border crossings Over under the what Biden administration. Over the Biden administration's. Uh, the last estimates I've seen show that there's like 13 to 15 million illegal immigrants, period, in the United States. You're telling me 7 million came in Seven in two million years? Crossings, three years? Yes. No. Hold on. Just That's to according check. to the CBD. Sure. So here's a fact check at home, okay, because I know that conservatives like to play fast and loose. Are they, is it 7 million border crossings or is it 7 million like catch and turn back? Or seven, is it 7 million confrontations at the border? The number is 7 million border crossings, and as far as the getaways, it's about 1.5 million, so, according so to the So you're telling me, is it, so to be clear, you're saying it's 7 million people have come from Total, Mexico. Total, yes. And then are now in the U.S., or yes. that it was 7 million encounters by Border Patrol agents? 7 million at the border, 1.5 million wait, just wait, got didn't, away. You didn't, so 7 million at the border was not border crossing, it was encounters at the border, to be clear, I mean, I right? could look up the number specifically. It was encounters. Well, it, it was encounters. Sorry, I know it was encounters. <laughs> um, well, the, so they in terms of when you talk about asylum seekers, um, 
the Biden administration is actually trying to do something about asylum seekers. They've worked with Latin American countries. Um, we've already got two asylum welcome centers at Guatemala and Colombia so that we can start processing people. We're having them stop off there. Oh, instead that's, of a just good, saying, that's a good backtrack to a Trump administration policy called remain in Mexico. That's fine, but the difference is Biden is actually capable of working with other people to get things done rather than Trump trying to do everything on his own, which he's unable to do so, and he can't even get like his own administration on board with doing something. Um, Biden also has places in Ecuador and Costa Rica where they're also setting up these uh, the, these actual like asylum areas where they can start to Biden process Biden also gave having... a whole billion dollars to every city in the United States of America to deal with their migrants. A whole one billion dollars. That's pretty impressive. Wait, what is the point of that? He gave a whole one billion dollars to deal with the migrants that are in all these cities across the country. Is that supposed to be a good point or a bad point? It's called like almost no money since New York has already spent $5 billion on it. A billion dollars to each state? To or cities to each city? overall. That's to, what he allocated to deal with the, with the crisis. When, when he allocated $1 billion to cities to, to deal with this crisis, was that just $1 billion? Just $1 billion to, spread to, over on. the city. Was it just $1 billion or was this part of like a massive multi like $100 billion package that was part of the, was it the American reinvestment plan where he gave billions and billions of dollars across every city across the United States to help shore up their budgets? Wasn't it pretty historic that almost no, no. every city and state was able to bring their budgets this to is even something due to... This yeah, is okay, something different. Ahead. He allocated recently from like executive funding after pressure from all these asylum seekers showing up, which by the way are smartly being shipped by Greg Abbott to the cities that asked for these people that said that they were welcome. He allocated a billion dollars from his executive funds, the funds that he could actually move around for all the cities, even though New York City alone is spending up to $5 billion per year on these people. How much money did Trump allocate to the cities? We didn't have all these people flooding <laughs> okay, the border during the Trump administration. All right. Well, yeah, because we had a genius policy the, called the, "Remain in Mexico." For the last year, we had a genius policy called COVID nineteen. Okay, <laughs> I'm pretty yeah. sure that was curbing immigration more than anything and else. And that was used as that was used as a mechanism to block people from entering over the border. Kind of sounds that's a also bit a good like policy. A, uh, uh, sounds a little bit like a great reset policy there, but um. To block people from entering the border. To use COVID-19 as a means to enact new policy. Well, this was the policy before. But. Um, if you think that adding new regulations are bad, I'm curious. One of Trump's hailing achievements was, you brought it up, um, the U.S. Mexican, uh, the U.S. Mexico Canada trade agreement. Um, do you recognize that this policy is basically just like NAFTA plus with a whole bunch of new regulations relating to uh, labor restrictions, green energy, stuff like that? Yeah, there are. What you call? It. Of course, there are regulations and in a trade agreement for sure. Okay. You acknowledge that the tariffs that Trump put on China were one of the largest tax increases that Americans have seen. It amounted to some $76 billion of tax paid by Americans across the United Look, States. There is a cost to taking on a global threat. And like sometimes you have to use economic policy as a backstop for national security policy. So yes, there are costs to things like tariffs. Like the economic voodoo that people promise, like from all different administrations that you're going to do a tariff over here and that's going to protect you over here and save your job. That's nonsense. But there is a legitimate national security reason why you want to weaken China. So well, there's a national security reason. Don't you think that the approach that President Biden took with the CHIPS Act in terms of encouraging billions of dollars of domestic uh, investment into semiconductor manufacturing in the U.S. is a better step than just slapping tariffs no, on China? No, because a lot of these semiconductors were already going to be produced in the United States. They were already setting well, up for they that. Were. They literally was, were not. It was a giant subsidy to these companies that were already going to do this in the first place. Okay, I mean, the audience, the, the, that's just wrong. Um, there were major companies that, were, that made you don't huge think... announcements. No, I don't think that semiconductor manufacturing is moving to the United States. Sands it was ramping up in subsidy. the United States. We had a giant chip shortage due to COVID-19. <laughs> of course it was. Uh, like this was already happening. You think with the global demand for semiconductors, like nobody was moving to produce them outside of China? Or Taiwan. No, or it wasn't Ta economically feasible to do so. That was the also, whole issue. That, that was the whole reason why we needed the CHIPS Act, was to get that initial investment to jumpstart the production in the United States. It wasn't happening in the United States. Again, it was <laughs> starting to come back to the United States, and that had to do with the fact that we had freezes in production in China due to COVID-19. So yeah, there was an economic impact of that. And then after that, the Biden administration decided we're going to throw some corporate welfare at these, at these companies that are already building these facilities over here. Okay, so, I mean, that just didn't happen, but I don't know what else to say. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can look up like companies, investment, USA, Chips Act, and see yeah. that these factories and these companies started to invest. Yeah, I mean, they, took the, they took the money for sure. Well, like, they needed the money because it's a high barrier of entry to some of the most sophisticated uh, and state-of-the-art production that's existed in anything across the entire world. Yeah, of course they needed the, no. the Head Start money, yeah. Nonsense.
Um, <clears throat> well, fuck. What other <laughs> what other areas do we think Trump is better than? I'll Trump give Trump one thing. I think he tweets better than Biden. I'll give him that. <laughs> that is a. I'll give a point to Trump in that category. I mean, he even invented his own social media company. That's how productive of a president he is. True. <laughs> that everybody in here is on, including me. I totally have an account there. What do you got for us? Yeah, what do you got James. for us, James? James. Thanks, to the, thanks to the Destiny subreddit, which gave us these prompts. Who is better on foreign policy, particularly with regard to the current conflict in the Middle East? Who has had a better record in the Middle East in the past? Oh, obviously the Trump administration would be better on foreign policy in the Middle East. Like, again, he was working to align our allies who had issues with non-recognition of each other against the common foe that is Iran. By contrast, you have the Biden administration having up to three potential spies on the team negotiating a nuclear deal with the Iranians. So, like, people who work for the Iranians, including Bob Malley, who had a Tavis security clearance pulled, that, that, that's the people that he has advocated for us, literal agents of foreign powers. Um, Trump didn't improve any of our standing anywhere in the Middle East. He hurt our relationship with the Kurds um, by abandoning them. Uh, he hurt our relationship with Afghanistan by not including them in the Doha agreements when he had talks to the Taliban. Uh, he drew down our U.S. force in Afghanistan and evacuated yeah, but all but Biden completed the single... withdrawal on the same timeline. Yeah, he, well, actually, yeah, he accelerated he it to have it out by 9-11. No, it was at the same timeline. Biden was essentially committed to it lest he risk more violence occurring in Afghanistan afterwards. Biden had no choice but to basically stick to the timeline no, he, that he Trump had put a, him on, he a, had a choice. on a collision course. He had a choice. No, he he, he could have left in the winter when it would have been easier and there would have been less fighting spirit. He decided that he wanted to leave in all, in and around the anniversary of September 11th because he liked that symbol. No. Making a, like making a foreign policy decision like that because you think it's like symbolically awesome was is stupid. That's what the Biden administration did. He gave speeches expressly saying that he wanted to be out before the 20 year anniversary of 9/11. Do you deny that that happened? He might have made those speeches, but the timeline was on the timeline agreed with the Taliban on the Doha agreements. The idea that you would wait for that timeline to extend would have been catastrophic because one of the parts of that agreement was that the Taliban wouldn't attack us as we were pulling out of Afghanistan. If you extend beyond that timeline and then you do that with the singular base and with the some 2,000 troops that Donald Trump left because he withdrew like 90 percent of our military presence from Afghanistan and he did it after having direct negotiations with the Taliban completely excluding the Afghanistan army from even being a part of those talks. Yeah, Donald Trump in every way, size, shape and form set the next president up for failure because he knew oh, that he might is, not have this is, a, this is a complete misnomer. And what part of what I just said was Well, first of all, you bring up the number of troops as if we don't do this trick in American foreign policy, which is have people who are private contractors who are former soldiers supplementing our forces. Now hold we, on, hold on, wait, let me so ask you. So we quick, had quick people You're in, saying that when Trump drew the troops we down had, from 13,000 to 2,000, that we brought in 10,000 private um, contractor people yeah, to work in the military? we had American military personnel, oh, I'm sorry, uh, these private contractors that were working under the auspices of the military to fill the gap. This is obvious. We've been doing this since the start of the wars in the Middle East because guess what? Those people don't get counted in statistics of American soldiers being killed. So yeah, we had tons of these contractors all across the Middle East. Okay, I just wanna give you one like, more chance on that. So you're telling me that Trump replaced all the US troops- I'm saying we had a significant donor. contractor's you, you, presence. No, no, hold on. You, you're, giving a general response to a specific question. I mean, My I specific can... question was, because it wasn't a general drawdown of troops, Donald Trump specifically drew down our military presence yes, in Afghanistan. Yes, it was on a withdrawal timeline that Biden also wanted to no, continue on Yes, it wasn't on, on a withdrawal, it was, on a, it was on a withdrawal timeline that he negotiated with yes, the Taliban. Yes, there was a withdrawal timeline. People wanted to leave wanted to leave Afghanistan, this is true. But he didn't, but include, yeah, he didn't you... include the Afghanistan army in those talks at all, why? Because the Afghanistani army is useless. Part of the reason why they were useless is because they were completely cut out of any of the negotiations. No, part of the reason why they were useless is, have you seen those people? It's full of addicts. Have you seen them do jumping jacks? They were never going to be a fit fighting force. Anybody can look up the videos. It's not a joke. Aren't those videos right. of people doing jumping jacks, weren't those literally the uh, the oncoming uh, Taliban fighters? No. The, Wasn't uh, it them no, going into the, the gyms and doing like the crazy This was the Afghani things? fighting force. But part of the problem with the, with the uh, what you call it, with the Afghanis, is that their military could not function without the support of American, uh, in, uh, what you call it, uh, these American contractors or military service personnel in order to operate certain equipment, identify targets and all that. They're essentially a force 
that needs to be supplemented by us. And the Biden administration not only withdrew the final uh, round of troops, but he was also aggressively pulling back these intelligence personnel. I knew people that were in Afghanistan working in these intelligence roles. They signed years long contracts because they were expected to continue beyond the Trump withdrawal, but they were yanked out of the field by the Biden administration. Okay, uh, I mean, it's a fantastic claim that Donald Trump was replacing all of the troops being drawn out. with. We private. already had these You're people there. No, we just didn't. You're just wrong. We all, um, you're I, telling I, me I, we I didn't have private military contractors We did not there. have private, no, that's not how private military contractors did. work. They don't replace a sitting army that's we working have them to there. large scale combat operations We in the have country. them there. That's not how PNC's work. We have them there in supplement to our military. Supplement. And, our military and, force was drawn down to some like 1,500 soldiers. And at certain soldiers. points, we actually end up having more of these contractors than actual you, registered American military you, you, service personnel. Even you personnel. don't believe this. This, this is, is 100% true. Even you don't believe this. This is This is 100% true. You, you, don't, you don't believe this. At points in you, you think, at you think to me, in the, you think that at any point in fighting in any Middle Eastern war, we have more private yes, military troops on the ground than actual U.S. military troops yes, fighting the war. 100%. Not, con, not like people that are doing construction, not people that are cooking in kitchens. Yes. Okay. Um, like this has happened. This is the way that we supplement our, our military. Supplement. Hold on. Don't say supplement. Now you're saying supplement. But before you're telling me these are our main fighting okay. force. The main fighting force of the U.S. armies in the Middle East are private military contractors. This is the way that we supplement you, our you supplement military again. forces. You, don't believe it you know you don't believe what you're again, saying. Again, you're yeah. not letting me finish because you know I'm correct. <laughs> no, this is the way we <laughs> supplement our military forces in the Middle East. We use private contractors. Sometimes they actually exceed the amount of military personnel that are there. And part of the reason why politicians are so quick to do this is not because they're cheaper, which is what your what your senators will tell you, but it's because we don't count these people in our soldiers' deaths, even though they've been in the U.S. military their whole lives and they just happen to get a job with this. But yes, there are different points in the Iraqi conflict and the Afghanistan conflict where we had more of these military intelligence that work for private companies than actual U.S. military service personnel. That is an absolute fact. Okay. I encourage the audience to look that up if you want. If you thought during the surge in Iraq, during any major occupation that our major fighting forces, PNCs, yeah. then uh, yeah. I, I mean, you can, you can I, read the book I'm called The sure. Modern Mercenary. You can learn about how this system developed and like why this is very politically advantageous. It's 100% fact. Now, by the way, most of the time, these are just people who were in the military. So like it is close enough to the approximate to our soldiers. So when you hear about American personnel dying over there, those are our troops. They just happen to be working for this country, uh, company that's being contracted out. Hold on, when stories like this come out, usually it's like Black Rock contractors killed in It event. would be Black Water. Or I don't Black know, Water Black Rock, you know, that's, well, they're I mean, buying all our real- Black Rock owns everything, so maybe they well, own maybe, the uh, private I mean, military contractors too. I mean, you just said they own like half <laughs> yeah. the military, apparently. Sure, apparently, I, all the yeah. private troops that are over there, yeah, I guess. Yeah, they are over there. Do you want me to look up the, the American military? Uh, private uh, contractors that are over there that are, are fighting for us. Yeah, go yeah. for it. You want me to? Do that? Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know what else, James. What other questions you got? You threw me off, Ryan. Thanks so much. Who is better for the economy given current inflation and Americans' current worry that the economy is headed for a recession soon? Um. I mean, I, I mean, obviously, I'm going to say Biden. I think that Biden has done a good job at trying to keep things under control, but <laughs> economic policy is a bit harder. I'm for sorry. Him. I'm sorry. Shut your face. Yeah. So there were 17,000 of these contractors as of April and the year that we drew, uh, drew out. The Biden administration dropped them to 7,800, and then closer to the withdrawal, they were dropped down to 2,700. This would be more than contractors, the contractors. I'm saying fighting. This would be force. more than fighting the. Oh, force. now you're changing the parameters. I didn't change it. I explicitly uh, said fighting. Now you're changing the parameters. And not only did I say explicitly, because uh, I said not people that are like there for construction, not people that are for cooks these or are, chefs. These, because as you said before, a lot of them are these supplementary. These are the people that we might actually contract at a company to do like food people. for a barracks, but those aren't our fighting forces. I'm not talking about chefs or con or construction workers. <laughs> these are the people that were in there. They are working as private security contractors, logisticians, and mechanics. Private so security is not yes, confrontational is military force. So you're saying private security is doing incursions into Taliban territory. For, nobody for, was, the, first of all, nobody was doing incursions at this point in time in the war in the first place. I said that they, we, the Afghanistani military needs us to or which is us in terms of contractors and or in terms of military personnel to identify targets for them so that they would do the fighting. The whole point of training the Afghan military was that they would do the fighting for us 
with the support from us. So these people were supposed to remain to keep them functioning. Some of these contractors, not all of them, I know you're gonna spaz out as soon as I say this, were mechanics that actually kept the equipment that they used running. There's a reason why they had all these helicopters and whatnot, but none of them were being taken off in order to fight against the Taliban because none of them can actually operate this equipment. This is what we had contractors for. This is what I was talking about the whole time. And yes, there were more of them, more destiny than active service personnel at that time. In okay, your face. I literally found the article that you're reading from, and the article itself is backing my point. The cuts are especially acute for private security contractors and for log uh, logistic lo uh, logisticians and mechanics, including the critical staff necessary to keep Afghanistan's fledgling aircraft aloft. These are not fighting private military the contractors. The mechanics are, are mechanics. I just said that, the mechanic. I knew you were going to say that. I just said, I know you're going to spaz Here's out when I say mechanics. Here's a direct quote from the article. It does suggest the U.S. is not substituting for troops with money for contractors, which is a claim you just made. They were substituting for troops, but again... <laughs> but then the article the you just read me contradicts that. Again, the mechanics at this point in the war, we're talking about earlier in the war where we used them as fighting force, but at this point in the war, we were supplementing the Afghani army, which is, again, okay, you can find something what that supports I just said. That, not an article what, that is the what is the mechanic exactly fixing? What you just said. Like, you think they're fixing the freaking Toyotas <laughs> out there? They're fixing the weaponry so that they can operate. Like, you're trying to combine statements that I said about different points in the war in order to be like, I got this W. But yes, they were supporting them at this point because this is what we were doing. This is what our soldiers were doing the Afghani army, because they were supposed to be the ongoing fighting force. So then just to be clear then, are you telling me that our main fighting force in countries are contractors or our military troops? At certain points in time during the Afghani and Iraqi war, we would use primarily or up to equal parts contractors and soldiers. I'm However, not, you say the at, okay. yeah, right, this, I, got, I got it. All right. At this point in time, <laughs> we were our soldiers and these contractors were working to supplement the Afghani army. Okay, I and mean, we pulled I, I, those I, I, people back too yeah. under the Biden administration. What other questions you got, James? I don't know if we've if you have any more on the economy per se. Oh yeah, the economy is easy. Economy. Inflation got out of control under the Biden administration. Gas prices went up. He did all these different like stimulus packages and whatnot that led to this. By comparison, in the Trump administration, the average American had $5,000 extra a year in their pocket. Excuse me for a second. And Biden actually recently announced an interesting thing related to his Inflation Reduction Act that didn't get a lot of attention. So because they passed this law that spent a bunch of money on the economy and a bunch of this money was going into red states because of the lower labor costs, Kamala Harris gave an announcement in Philadelphia recently that they were going to try to use the regulatory power in order to amp up the wage requirements for these red states. Now that might sound good if you're in these red states, you might be thinking, oh, I'm gonna get a raise due to these regulations. But remember, this was announced in Philadelphia. And the purpose of this being announced in Philadelphia was to redirect this Inflation Reduction Act funding to the Midwest, to Pennsylvania, to the states in order to secure his election win. So not only was the economy better for the average American under the Trump administration, but the Biden administration is openly manipulating these funds, which were naturally going to the uh, burgeoning economies in these red states, to redirect them in order to secure his political support. This is disgusting behavior. It's indefensible. Go ahead, defend it. I know you want so to. So disgusting and indefensible behavior would be Donald Trump trying to put FICA tax cuts on employees and then sunsetting it. So not only would it expire if he himself didn't extend them, but so that retroactively, all of those FICA, FICA tax would be owed by workers as part of the, uh, when he was trying to do stimulus for people because he was hoping that he could fuck over the next incoming administration if they didn't extend his particular uh, economic tax cuts. That would be an example of disgusting behavior. Um, in That's terms of like smart inflation, policy right there. you can call it smart policy. For the rest of yeah, us, it's disgusting behavior. Yeah, you, I like you, how anything Donald Trump does is smart policy. I didn't say we anything he does is smart policy. But unfortunately, the president of the United States does not control inflation around the world. There's not much that we could do about that. Um, if we look around at inflation around the world, uh, every country is experiencing inflation. As part of the G7, the United States inflation is lower than every other country that we have in the G7. Number one. Number two, in terms of gas prices, there's only so much that Biden can do. Uh, he released a lot of the um, 
the petroleum reserves in the United States. That to was try a that disaster. Uh, that was for you emergencies. Can say it's a it was an emergency. Gas prices were really high. Pri price uh, increases one, are not an emergency. It was more of an emergency than the border crisis was that Donald Trump tried to contravene Congress on because he couldn't pass legislation to take troops down to the border to try to do immigration policy. So it was absolutely enough an emergency for him to do it. Also, uh, again, nice domestic deflection. oil production. Domestic oil production is higher today in the United States than it has been in all of history. I don't think that there's much more that Biden can do unless we're expecting him to solve international inflation um, other than what he's already done. Unfortunately, the president can only do so much with the economy. Uh, in terms of Americans having more money under Trump than Biden, that's not surprising. Donald Trump did insane deficit spending. Um, Donald Trump gave a lot of money and a lot of tax cuts. He didn't pair it with spending cuts. Donald Trump enjoyed, again, historically unbelievably low interest rates that probably played into a lot of the inflation, especially in the housing market that we experience today. Yes, if you run an economy at 0% interest rates with the Federal uh, Reserve and you continue to just do that, and then you spend a fuck ton and then you give a lot of tax cuts and then you give a lot of people stimulus and you don't rein in any of your spending. Yeah, I'm sure people are going to have a lot of money in their wallet at the end of the day, but as happened with Obama and Bush, what do we have? We get a, an economic catastrophe and then eventually the next Democrat that comes in has to deal with it while the prior Republican president that was spending like a madman, even though Republicans always talk about controlling spending, uh, gets to claim somehow that they were doing good things for the economy while controlling spending, you, even though we had no desire to do no, so. No, look, the Trump administration definitely could have done better on spending by a lot. I agree with you. There's some COVID stimulus that honestly just blew out the spending, which carried over into the Biden administration. Although the emergency had already subsided when they passed their COVID stimulus, even though I agree with you, actually, like both of these could have been pared down. The PPP program, totally disastrous. 100% true, but I will say interest rates were cut sharply after the 08 recession. Throughout the whole Obama administration, they had low interest rates. That did not spur the economic growth that we saw under the Trump administration. Things like regulatory restrictions being removed and all these other factors definitely played into it. As far as the FICA tax, when you pass something through reconciliation, some of it has to be sunsetted after 10 years. That's the way that they got their tax. Sunsetting is a lot different than retroactively owing what you had been missing your taxes. Yeah, that was so, a new thing that Donald Trump tried to do to punish an incoming administration. Hmm, kind of similar to that country in, uh, in the Middle East, Afghanistan, so again, the Taliban. So one Interesting of, pattern of behavior. So when, when you end up passing something like this into law, you can strategically, if you want it to go through, put the least pop, oh, I'm sorry, the most popular things up for vote so Congresses in the future have to act. This is why I called it good strategy. Another good strategy in there was the salt cap, which basically said, if you're one of these wealthy people who votes for Democrats who have high state income taxes and all these high taxes, you can no longer deduct those taxes above $10,000, which was a cutoff for the super rich in those places against your federal taxes because all these rich people would back these Democrats and they'd vote for these higher taxes in these left-leaning cities, left-leaning states, and then they would use that as a deduction against their federal taxes. The Trump administration said, no, if you're going to vote for taxes in your local in your local economies, in your state economies, then you should actually pay the consequences of what you vote for rather than deduct that from the federal government's tax. I'm sorry, so do you think that people ended up paying more in salt taxes that were earning more than uh, it would have been enough income to, what was the cutoff, $10,000 in state and local tax liabilities? Do you think that those people ended up paying more in taxes in, when you take into account the federal tax cuts that Trump had? I think, well, some of them did pay more in taxes, for sure. And a lot of them moved in order to avoid it because they didn't want to live under the policies that they had helped and advocated for. This is why a lot of these people moved in there. So I actually think that was a smart policy. And again, they have to, you have to pay for your city's taxes if you're going to vote for your city and lobby and support politicians that have higher city taxes or higher state taxes. So I think that was a good policy because if you have a no income tax state like the great state of Texas, then you should enjoy the benefits of that and not have the federal government subsidize these blue cities and blue states that do the opposite. So I think well, that- Doesn't the federal government send more money? Isn't there more subsidies going to red states I mean, and red areas? By definition, blue places just tend to be well, more economically prosperous so the, than large the, cities. So the trick that a lot of people will use is they'll cite like the state of Kentucky <laughs> and say, look at all the federal dollars going in there. But the state of Kentucky has Fort Knox and those federal dollars included for those military bases count in the federal government spending in terms of the accounting. Fort Knox has like something like 10,000 soldiers in it. It's where we keep all our gold. I'm sorry, do you think the majority of the disproportionate spending on red states is for military bases? A lot of it is related to military Why, do you, bases. Do you notice you sure. never answer a question? A lot of it? Do you think there aren't military it bases in blue it, states? It depends on the state. But Are there yeah. military spaces in blue states? Is there a base like Fort Knox in a state 
that is blue that's comparable in size. Is Fort Knox accounting for the disproportionate amount of money spent it's in every a, single red state in the United a huge, States? It's a lot of red states are sparsely populated, so larger military bases in those states yes, are going to be disproportionate in terms of spending. Wouldn't the sparse population of a state contribute to its lack of economic contribution to federal funds? Isn't that the whole reason no, but, why red states tend to need more? In, like, all you're doing is making an argument no, 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 for because, because they don't have many people Because it there. would based on the, it would be, ba what they're paying into taxes, we would grade based on a per capita basis, obviously. Would we not? Like, we would account for their population in that metric. Don't people on military bases pay taxes? Sure, but they're being, but the federal spending in terms of raw dollar amount in a state with a smaller population is going to represent a bigger portion of that state's GDP. Like this is like that basic is a, mathematics. Well, you're using a phenomenal conspiracy theory. To it's not. A, to it's explain. not a conspiracy it theory. It is the, the the ultra well understood economic theory is that cities, not saying good or bad, I'm, cities are always more economically prosperous. I didn't prosperous. say. I didn't say they're they were. always generating more. You're trying to make it sound like the I lower say, amount of total citizens no, in a state is going to mean that a higher percentage of federal funds are spent on the no, military no, no, basis, no. and that's going to account so, for the difference in no, subsidization no, of those states. That's exactly that's what your argument is. No, that's no, you're completely you. misunderstanding. What part? So what, what, you, what did I just say that was wrong about your argument? You sp if you're spending on a military base, a fixed amount of the defense budget in a particular state that is sparsely populated, then that fixed amount is going to, it, it's going to represent a bigger percentage of their GDP as compared to their tax rates than it would in a larger state like California. My point is basic math. You're just trying to go end around to argue just to argue. I'm not, the point isn't basic math because yes, you, don't it is even, basic you math. don't even know how many military bases are in these states. You're hedging this whole argument on the on the assumption well, that I don't know the number of military well, personnel in every K state. Kentucky, like, no, no, Kentucky is often used as an example. I'm not of using a, Kentucky as an I'm, example. Well, that's great. Kentucky is often used, not by you in this moment. Like, I'm not saying you just said that. I didn't hear that from you. Like, do, do I need to clarify that anymore? No, it's just a, it's so just Kentucky's a often like, one-off argument. Kentucky, that, like, like, I, like, I happen to know that military, like, do you, here's a question. Do you think there are more military No, 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 my point, is that, my point is that you actually don't know. That's why you're making this point. So Kentucky is often used because people like to go after Rand Paul on this, and it turns out the bulk of this federal welfare spending, supposedly, that's going to the state of Kentucky goes to exorbitantly large military bases, which represent a larger portion of a small state like Kentucky's budget as compared if you were to put Fort Knox into the state of California. Again, I'm not sure like what is so hard to understand about this. You understand that 10,000 soldiers in small state of under a million population, like in theory, would be a bigger percentage of that state's economy than in the state of California, which has 38 million people. Like, that, that should be pretty straightforward. Um, yeah, I'll look up this, but uh, I, I just, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'm looking up like the like the lar Kentucky's largest spending areas per capita were the number one is public welfare, number two is K through 12 education, number three is health and hospitals, number four is, is higher education. Is that from education. the Kentucky state budget? Obviously, the Kentucky state budget is going to be there. <clears throat> So, okay, so you're telling me that, if I, okay, I've got, I'm going to try to find the, the exact amount of money spent on military bases in Kentucky. I'm curious, do you think that if we equalize for military spending, do you think that's going to significantly change the amount of federal investment? That go, if we adjust to that on a per capita, that's going to significantly change the amount of federal investment between blue states and red states? Oh, for sure, yeah. Okay. I, I don't I, think I, it's going to... It's I, a novel economic I think, theory that I think I've never heard positive I think you'll, in my entire life. I think life, you'll probably, so. I think you'll probably, because there are definitely poor red states, I think you'll probably end up with more red states on, on the uh, top or the bottom of the list, depending on how you're counting it, but it won't be so glaring by comparison. So yeah, it's definitely going to shake up the order significantly. Gotcha. And the only reason I know this is because they, I remember this being specifically argued against Rand Paul about the uh, state of Kentucky. Uh, I'm sure Rand Paul has said it, but I... No, no, it was <laughs> argued as a way to insult Rand Paul, and then when people looked into the state of Kentucky, this is what they found. Interesting. Okay. Although Kentucky, I mean, technically I have a blue governor, so are they a red state? I would say yes. Anything else, uh, James? Sure thing. I'm going to ask this one. Who is better at preventing or reducing crime in the U.S.? Uh -oh. mm. This is actually an interesting question because... I would say old Senator Joe Biden, crime bill Joe Biden, the best Joe Biden of all time, would be significantly better than the evil orange man who passed, uh, what's, what's that stupid law called? The First Step Act. But new Joe Biden? Nah. Like, he doesn't have it. He's all about diversity, equity, and inclusion. He's so obsessed with fighting evil white racism under every rock 
that he has Pete Buttigieg looking for racism in highways. Like, this guy is not a serious person. This is true. Go look at his speeches. Uh, this, this is not a serious person. This is what the Biden administration is focusing on. And they're seeking to forward the, the what you call, forward the progression towards going softer on crime. And the proof in the pudding is in the number of consent decrees that have been issued by the Biden administration, which is dramatically up from the Trump administration's. In fact, I think the Trump administration might not have put a single police department under consent decree during his entire term. It might have been one, and there might have been some leftovers that screw up the account from the Obama administration, but Joe Biden, he's going absolutely wild with it. He did it to the Minneapolis PD, who honestly, if we're being perfectly honest, have had no major scandal worthy of this ever in their history and definitely not in their recent history. Uh, if we're holding presidents uh, accountable for, I guess, crime and stuff that happens in the country, I'm pretty sure Donald Trump loses because of the George Floyd riots, like, end discussion. If we're going to hold him accountable for stuff like that, I mean, those happen under Trump. Um, also, as a quick thing, I did look up what Sean said, uh, and I can see that the federal funds that were spent in Kentucky, um, three is the Department of Agriculture at $2 billion, um, two is the Department of Veteran Affairs at $2.5 billion, and then one is the Department of Defense at $8.3 billion, so. Uh, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding, actually. Department of Defense was number this. three at $8.3 billion. Two was the Social Security Administration at $19 oh, billion. And people. one was the Department of Health and Human Services at $116 billion. So the wow. idea that military bases are what's playing into Kentucky's like absorption of federal funds is bullshit. And Kentucky was your go-to example, so I'm guessing this is probably the most extreme one you could find. So that's bullshit. No, this is nonsense. We have a ton of spending on health care in the United States and Social Security. But you're talking about welfare spending in particular. Are you counting Social Security and Medicare as welfare? I'm saying that the federal funds that are absorbed by Kentucky and spent on things like this are well, not how much primarily health, going to... How much does Health and Human Services go to these other places? <laughs> I don't know, but I know that blue states pay more in federal tax receipts, federal funds tax receipts, or federal tax receipts than, than they get back uh, on average versus red states that tend right, to absorb I'm more. To because, go, as I'm going to have said, to go into my Google machine right now. Red states more sparsely populated. Red states don't have the same level of economic mm. prosperity as like cities do. Not to any fault of rural people, but they just tend to not produce as I'm much economic activity. I'm going to have to go activity. into my Google machine now, too. <laughs> um, Did you hear the other question? Or are you like Yeah, about the crime thing. Um, I, I mean, in terms of like what presidents can do on crime, I'll give Donald Trump a little bit of credit for the First Step Act. I think that reducing the amount of time people are spending, uh, spending in federal prison is in general a good thing to try to curb that down. But our federal prison population is just not as important. And if anything, I think that the things that Donald Trump did there, Sean would probably disagree with. Um, like for instance, we I think the under Donald Trump as part of that First Step Act, I think they tried to claw back or, or take back like how harsh the sentencing disparity was between like crack cocaine and powder cocaine and stuff like that. So I don't even know if Sean would agree with the Trump administration there, but. Yeah. Oh, for the disparities between cocaine and crack cocaine, I'm, I'm, if you want to get rid of that, that's perfectly fine. But I will say the crack sentences match the meth sentences perfectly, which, you know, those drugs are similar in terms of the violence that is associated with it. But, you know, if you wanted to do that because you think that they're the same drug and that's the determining factor, I wouldn't be against that. That's our next question. Sure oh, thing. I mean, I would also say as a, as a thing there. It's hard to have a president who talks about law and order when Donald Trump is facing like 90 some indictments. Wait, I think I that also hurts his, um, I think that hurts his case as well. Can I just ask you which year you were looking at for Kentucky? Um, let's see, these are total state, this is on Ballotopedia and I think the most recent one was 20, was it 17? I'm not sure, hold on. But I doubt it's changed significantly since then. Well, the year does matter, but continue on with your talking. You know, you can find that for me later. Yeah, Donald Trump is uh, hard to be the president of law and order when you're potentially running your next campaign from a jail cell. All right. <laughs> so next prompt: Who is better to help resolve the war by uh, by Russia on the Ukraine? Um, I think when it comes to foreign affairs, the most important thing you can do is coalition build. And if there's anything that Donald Trump has shown time and time again that he is not capable of doing, both domestically and uh, internationally is building coalitions. Donald Trump cannot, to save his life, get a group of people to be excited about joining a coalition with him, supporting him, and working on solving problems around the world. Uh, it's just not his forte. Um, obviously, if you follow the plan that was set out in the Middle East, he's very good at coalition building. He got nations like Saudi Arabia, Israel, and all these Islamic nations that have never been friendly with the Jewish state to align with them. And I think that's pretty stellar. 
All right, this one. Who is better for immigration? Um, the honest reality is, like, right now, Americans just don't care about immigration that much. It's not at the forefront of anybody's uh, agenda. Um, I know that Donald Trump wanted to do a whole bunch of stuff with immigration, but he didn't. We, obviously, there's no comprehensive immigration reform. Donald Trump tried to lead through executive action, which any conservative should be against. Uh, and then worse than executive action, he tried to invoke like a state of emergency to fix immigration issues at the border, uh, which again, even the, 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 the old inner conservative Nebraska part of me shudders a little bit in terror that a president that has such a majority in the House and Senate can't bring his party together to actually do any kind of actions on immigration. And he has to rely on like, wartime powers as the president to, to try to get any of his policy done at the border. Well, first and foremost, the state of emergency happened, which was COVID-19, when he didn't have both chambers of Congress. So, like, that's why it was declared. Yeah, but he could have, he ran on the wall and he did have both yeah, chambers of Congress. I mean, Congress there are things he, that he could have done to, to pro pass things more legislatively. Unfortunately, immigration reform is something that many different administrations have failed to get through. However, on the executive level, and the president does have power over law enforcement agencies, the policies that he came up with, and like some of them were creative reinterpretations of laws, some which which is true. Like creative inter that Trump is does have creative interpretations. Well, his of legal law, team I has will. that. Yes. But again, the Remain in Mexico Re policy is probably the most rational immigration policy that has come out of any administration, and you would be in support of it if it came from somebody not named Donald Trump, which basically says you can't abuse our asylum system. And Biden ran on letting these people search the border. They did search the border. We're dealing with unprecedented migrants coming into this country. And now people are feeling the effects of it. So I completely disagree. I think more people Wait. care about immigration than ever before because they're being shipped all over the country. This isn't just a problem that you could say, oh, well, screw you to the southern border states. You guys suck. You guys deal with it. So I do think the Trump administration is clearly better on immigration just based on the facts and the numbers. So, no. Um, well, first of all, when we say feeling the effects of it, uh, I'm pretty yes. sure like unemployment in the United States is unbelievably ro low right now. No, Labor no, shortages are massively uh, affecting like every single state. The idea that we're feeling this like surge of illegal immigrants like destroying the country everywhere, I, I just I don't think that's true. Um, yeah, I just, I, I don't think yeah, that's true. And also, I, when I think about, like, Biden and Kamala Harris, isn't Kamala Harris, wasn't one of her most famous, like, Mimi quotes early on? Wasn't it her looking at the camera being like, do not come? Yeah, do after not come. the fact. Like, wasn't that literally, like, their policy of, like, yeah, hey, after don't... we get overwhelmed, they're like, okay, maybe maybe this is a little ridiculous. What are we like, overwhelmed ju by? Just like, overwhelmed? Just, like after, just like after the migrants started getting shipped to New York City and to Chicago, Brendan Johnson and Eric Adams suddenly visited Mexico and the southern border. So, yeah. Wait, people, were they upset when I because they were being overwhelmed by migrants, or were they upset because people were being shipped in buses by other governors with absolutely no place to stay? Well, first of all, they passed a law saying that they wanted them there, number one. Number two, Two, one of the big misnomers. Wait, is, they passed a law saying we want people to yeah, bus immigrants to our states. Not that specifically. They what said the, yeah. they were saying that they were welcoming to immigrants, that they were not going to work with federal law enforcement. They actually strengthened previous um, sanctuary city laws under Lori Lightfoot while Trump was president as an own to the orange man and under Bill de Blasio in order to make themselves seem like the most welcoming place. Then the migrants come. New York City has to cut 5% from everything in the budget, according to Eric Adams. And all of a sudden, it's a problem. All Wait, of a sudden, do you think it's when a national says we problem. We want to be more welcoming number to immigrants. One, that means number you want two, people shipped up in buses on the border with no homes. Number to two, the percentage. What an unbelievable number two, bad faith the percentage, of that, okay. the percentage of migrants that are actually being shipped from Greg Abbott is actually low in comparison to two things. One, the amount of migrants being shipped by the Democratic mayor of El Paso. And by the way, these migrants are being shipped, they're asking to go to New York. And the reason why they're asking to go to New York and Chicago is because they have policies that incentivize them to go there. So in New York, we have a right to shelter law, which means if you go up to a New York City official and you say that I wanna be housed, then they have to house you. This is one of the reasons why, because they pass a ridiculous law without thinking of the consequences that they're spending so much money on this problem. In, under Chicago law, they don't verify your immigration status before they put you through these programs. So, it, so yeah, Greg Abbott's doing it. It is a political stunt. The reason you're getting so upset, and I can hear it in your tone, is because it's working. It's making people think about immigration in a way that they didn't when it was just the problem of Southern states. 
And now, all of a sudden, these super blue governors, all the uh, um, blue governors like Hochul, and blue mayors like Eric Adams, and I give a credit to Brandon Johnson, he's still doubling down on migrants as of right now, are feeling the backlash from it, and they're pressuring the Biden administration to change policy. So yes, for sure, it's more on the minds of people across the country than it was before. Yeah, I just, the idea that there are these massive migrant problems, it's always a Republican talking point to go to the border, take some pictures, and try to like act like this is a massive problem. You don't have to go to the States. border. You could just go to but, Times um, Square now. I don't think... Um, I, Grand Central Terminal, they're coming in. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure I was in Times Square like two months ago. I must have missed all the illegal immigrants flooding the streets, but maybe I just Grand didn't go to the Central right place terminal. on... Maybe I just... Yeah, I... I, I've seen scary homeless people there, but I don't think I saw a surge of Spanish-speaking sombrero-wearing immigrants that are like in the bus station uh, uh, that like Destiny. have no place they, they to. They yeah. don't. They don't um, actually. But maybe I must they, be going to the wrong place in Times Square. When you go there, you can take pictures of it. They, show it to they, they don't Twitter. actually sure wear to. sombreros, bro. Yeah. You just did a racism. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I just did a racism about shipping people up from the border with no place to say, dropping them they off. Wanna, the they want to. They want to go to New point. York. I'm sure they do. They okay. want to go to New York. I'm why? Sure, why is it? Why should it be Texas and Arizona's problem and not the problem of the people who pass laws? Why should it be New York? And who? vote for the people at the national level that want to welcome in migrants. Why should it just be based on your proximity to the border? Who has to spend the money and resources yeah, to deal with this? I think different different states deal with different problems. New York had to deal disproportionately with COVID. And I never hear conservatives like they, they never stop talking about how horrible the blue state New York was ravaged by COVID, largely because that's one of the largest international uh, crossing points in the fucking well, world also, in terms of traffic. They also put the elderly so course, in nursing homes. Yeah, that didn't happen. And, also, and guess what? And if Donald like, Trump uh, was uh, such a failure in bringing his face together, Together, he cries every time he's doing are a you, speech. Are you are you vaccine, comparing, so. are you comparing yeah. migrants to are nice you comparing pivot, migrants pivoting. to a virus? No, you're pivoting. I'm not pivoting. I'm you're asking pivoting. you about your I'm not, analogy. I'm saying that different states in the United States have different issues that they deal with. I'm sure that border states, especially southern border states, are going to have a different issue yeah. that they deal with for migration. But the, even the idea that border states are somehow united on their discontent for immigration doesn't make sense because California is a blue state and they probably have more illegal immigrants than fucking any state of the United States. Oh, so, I mean, that's fine for yeah. California. If they want to live up to their values, they can. But but the thing, the difference is, is that immigration policy is expressly a federal issue. So you're saying that the states have to pay the cost of this federal policy based on their proximity to the border, but also they can't really initiate any policy to change it. But then you have these people in these blue states, in these blue cities, who on a national level vote for people like President Biden, who said he wanted these people to flood to the border as soon as he got elected to office. Hold on. Bi hold, just, just check. This That's was in quote. the campaign. Bi Biden said, yes. I want people to flood yes. to the border. Asylum seekers, welcome. He's going to no, open the on. gates. No, hold on. Asylum seekers, I, let me welcome. Finish the quote. Let, let me finish the quote. The okay, yes, he said flood to the border. You can look it up. Was he talking about illegal immigrants this or asylum in, seekers? Well, the, all these, all well, some of these illegal immigrants are abusing the asylum system right now. Like that's their go-to move. Gotcha. Okay. Hence the Remain in Mexico policy. But yes, they asked for these immigrants to come. All the Democrats in the Democratic primary were competing on how open they can make the border. I remember uh, uh, one of the twins, the, the Latino twins, one was the mayor and one was a member of Congress. His name eludes me at this time. He was talking about how he wanted to decriminalize border crossing. I, I just forget this guy's name. Um, I think it was Juan Castro or Julian Castro. Those are the two twins. But whichever one was running for president, like that guy was like, he wants to decriminalize it. They were basically competing on who could be more open to immigration. Well, I don't even know what that means. Like, don't we want the border crossing to be like decriminalized? Do we want to arrest people that come yes. to the United States? Yes, it's, I want it to you be You want to hold effect. every single, that's the most open border policy I've ever heard in my life. I want to. You want every single like encounter at the border to take all these people and house them in federal no, prisons? No, you arrest them, you charge them, and then you eject them. You arrest them and, okay, yeah. I don't know what to, okay. So, so then you wouldn't want them put into jails. I want them. I want them sent back. Okay. One of those rapid deportations that you can actually do at the border, which is why they why they claim asylum to avoid that. All right. We're gonna go into our Q and A now, everybody. So uh, everybody who was here before, you know what to do. If you weren't here earlier, uh, just make a line from here to the back. Please move to the left if anybody needs to get by you. Thank you so much. Thank you, our speakers. And coming up, your first question. Thanks for the lively debate, gentlemen. My question is for Sean. Yes. Are you familiar with the uh, country and the company that nearly all of our mobile silicon and the silicon used by our military comes from? Uh, I'm no, I'm not. Uh, Taiwan and TSMC is where all of it comes from, and one of the large things that Biden did with that chip pack is bring some of TSMC's manufacturing over to the country. So, 
Just point of clarification. Right. Yeah, I'm not saying that it's all 100% bad, but a lot of these companies were going to ramp up production in the United States, and this was just a subsidy on top of this. TSMC was not. Okay, I mean, they that, might not in, be in particular. Act, that yeah. act brought TSMC over. Sure. I think Intel, wasn't, wasn't there a statement by Intel that they were waiting on whether that legislation would pass before they started, um, before they started, I think, I think Intel... Was it? Yeah, yeah might, I'm, I'm not surprised by that. If there's legislation being kicked around and you want to wait so you can get that because it's a huge subsidy to you, then you would probably do that. Yeah, I'm not too informed on like uh, illegal immigration, but uh, one statistic I did see is that a large portion of illegal immigrants are actually overstayed visas. So would you like, you know, fake news or what do you... What do oh you yeah, know? a huge portion of them are overstayed visas. Like, So do we just send them back? I, I mean, I would do case by case basis. It depends. Like, you on know, that many people? I, I don't know what the number of people is, but that's why I would try to do a case by case basis because if you try to eject however many millions of overstays there are, that could be a logistical nightmare. All right. So, yeah, you could give people a chance to reapply, become, get legal status or whatever. Sometimes people go through the process, they get a student visa, they graduate, and then they end up with an issue where they try to get a work permit, that gets denied, and then they kind of stay and they're in limbo. I would let those people like reapply, try to get through something. And just uh, quick for both of y'all, lame question. Uh, I know Destiny could answer it, like, two good things about Trump, you know, tax cuts and stuff. Uh, Sean, I want to ask you, two good things about Biden. That's what. Oh, two good things about Biden. Um, I will say the, the fact that he has continued to double down on arming the Ukrainians in this conflict, like, we do have to have a check against Russian aggression. And, like, I think that that's a good thing, even though a lot of people on the right don't think it's a good thing. And... Another thing about Joe Biden is, I mean, I really, really liked his speeches. All right. Your thanks for your question. Next up. My question is about civil asset forfeiture. So in 1984, Biden was the one that put in for the Comprehensive Control Act, which allowed for civil asset forfeiture. When Trump was asked about in a meeting with a bunch of, I believe, police leaders about civil asset forfeiture, what he thought about it once it was explained to it, he says it's a wonderful, great thing. I believe it's a violation of our Fourth, Fifth, and Eighth Amendment right, that they can take money without convicting you of a crime because he suspects it's related to some type of criminal activity, and you cannot, it's very hard to get those money and assets back because the government has immunity. So um, between Biden and Trump, are any of them making any progress to change that thing? I think they're both wrong. Can presidents do Thanks anything about, isn't civil asset forfeiture, wouldn't that be like a police department by police department thing? It was actually a bill that Biden supported in 1984 that allowed for it to happen. Um, I would say, so unfortunately there is some common law that backs up civil asset forfeiture, but I do agree. I think it's just a straight up violation of the takings clause of the Fifth Amendment. If they take something of value of yours, they have to compensate you for it, uh, or there has to be due process of law. Um, I, the, the Department of Justice can decide whether or not they're going to federally uh, do this on a federal level. And my guess would be, and this is based solely on the Obama administration, that Biden might be more apt to do this because I believe Obama did it, but I don't know. And I don't know if the, it continued through the Trump administration or not, or quick, if they reinstated the policy. Quick clarification. There, I believe the Fifth uh, Fifth Circuit Court just had a case where they used that, the Fifth Amendment, to recover, to get around qualified immunity or absolute immunity or like that. They tried to say, well, oh, it was, it was uh, somebody came, the police came in, destroyed my house, the police have immunity, and they were able to use that clause of the They're Fifth Amendment off. to get recovery just recently this year. Yeah. I think it's a terrible policy. It is a clear violation, in my opinion, of your Fifth Amendment rights. Uh, if I had to guess, I would say Biden would probably be better for that specific policy at a federal level. But that's completely based on the prioritization of it under Obama's Justice Department, assuming they're similar enough. All right, next question. I'm more than a little confused on some of your positions, and I don't think it's my fault. So I'm going to see if I can sort that out. Um, you're capitalist. Consider yourself capitalist. Right. Sure. And also would maintain that inflation is a bad thing. Yeah, inflation is a problem. Yeah. There's a couple well, high inflation. There's a couple of ways. This isn't like an exclusive list, but there's in a couple a couple different ways that you can handle inflation. You can either implement policy and you can try and use taxes to take those funds out of circulation to reduce the money supply. Alternatively, you 
can increase the number of goods flying around the market for those dollars to chase them, or you can increase the overall number of people. Given your positions on immigration, I'm trying to sort out whether or not you don't understand the principles of the economic system that you claim to hold, or if you just don't like immigrants coming into the country for no particular good reason or don't really care about it. So, I mean, this is an interesting proposition that immigra- like increasing immigration is a good solution to economic inflation. So the government spending too much money, injecting more money into the economy through stimulus, chasing the same amount of goods, which actually during the pandemic was a decreasing amount of goods due to the due to what you call it, supply chain shortages that he accurately points out were occurring worldwide caused inflation again worldwide now maybe the effects in the united states were lower in comparison to those countries due to a number of reasons like having the reserve currency and all that but regardless the idea that we in order to deal with inflation we should give up control over our borders i don't agree with i'm not going to support and there's nothing about me not liking immigrants to say that people in this country that are citizens of this country have the right to determine their own immigration policy and consistent and chill with that. It's not about being inconsistent. There are other ways to address inflation. Like you just said, increasing the number of goods available. Well, we had a lot of lockdowns in the economy that restricted supply. I would be against those lockdowns. That's a consistent position. And I don't think we should give up control of our immigration policy in order to fight inflation. But considering yourself capitalist, we don't have it in the Bible of Capitalism by Adam Smith. We don't have it in the various teachings and books and speeches. Look, the done market by economy, Friedman, the market economy. Pr- is cool. we, we don't have it from all of these capitalist sources over literal centuries that immigration is tr- chill. And you even have it from Milton Friedman that illegal immigration is the best kind because it's the one that's easiest to exploit. Yeah. So like I said, I'm a capitalist. I, I'm in favor of private property rights and people making economic decisions based on voluntary transactions. I'm also an American and any citizen of any country in the world has the right to determine their borders, determine who comes in their country. And even though this isn't like a capitalist utopia or whatever, you can still hold these positions. My preferred economic system is one with minimal regulations, people's private property rights protected. My preferred nation state is one that actually has the people of the nation dictating its policies, which are including immigration. All right, next question. All right, so I have a bit of a hypothetical question for both of you. Um, Who do you guys think would have handled COVID better? Or better yet, who do you think is better at handling crises and why? Between what are the options? Oh, uh, Biden and Trump. Well, Trump was president during COVID. And (laughs) so, like, you can grade him on how he handled that. I mean, it's an unprecedented virus and all that. But I do think, even though I don't like the way that different local municipalities went, that giving it to the local governments was a better option because you could have different governments experiment on what policies they wanted to implement. So Florida had a relatively, excuse me, Florida had a relatively limited lockdown. Places like New York had a severe lockdown. And you can see the consequences of that, not just in terms of the virus, but the post-economic consequences of that. People leaving certain cities like the city of New York that lost something like 400,000 residents, not to dying from the virus, but due to people just wanting to move out. California being a net population loser for the first time. So we could see each of these individual states and their laboratories of innovation at work. And I feel like, and the real options at the time were going to be Biden, I'm not Biden, Hillary or or um, or Biden, but I think Biden with this new virus and that new opportunity would have went for a more national top-down approach. So that being said, honestly, governors handled it better in my opinion than President Trump did because there wasn't like a ton of national direction on it. Yeah, I think we've seen a number of like emergencies uh, internationally and domestically. And I think that when it came time for Biden to handle things, I, I'm pleasantly surprised that I think Biden has done an exceptionally good job at building coalition and consensus. Um, domestically, it doesn't really count as emergencies, but when we talk about legislation, 
Biden has passed more major legislation than anybody thought he'd be able to with a 50-50 Congress. Um, when it comes to it being an international leader, uh, I think that Biden's efforts to shore up the feelings of all of our NATO countries to get them to contribute more than us to Ukraine, I think was amazing. Biden did a really good job at coalition building. He did a really good job in decisions relating to the declassification of intelligence to keep track on Russian moves. And he's done a, a really good job at making sure that the Ukraine project, learning from our mistakes in Iraq and Afghanistan, was one that like the entire friendly U.S. world was on board with and not something that was just a U.S.-led mission uh, with no clear uh, defining factors or goals. I would say the same thing is happening in Israel, where Biden is walking an incredibly fine line of saying that we are going to be a strong ally to Israel, but Biden has been a very strong check on the amount of destruction that's happening in the Gaza Strip right now because of his check on uh, Israel. So for instance, uh, Israel delayed their invasion uh, into Gaza. Um, Israel was encouraged to allow humanitarian aid in, um, and uh, Israel has been encouraged to, uh, with, with severe pressure from the Biden administration, to dramatically curtail or limit or be careful of the amount of civilian destruction with explicit warning from the United States that you are going to lose support if you continue, if you act in a reckless manner. Um, so. Uh, international that was fine. Domestically, uh, I mean, if we look at the differences in COVID, it's hard to compare, obviously, because you had one before and one after. But uh, Biden, uh, what did he promise? In 100 days, he would have uh, how many vaccines rolled out? He had it done in like 48 or 52 days. Uh, Biden worked to make sure that almost every American, I think it was like 90% of Americans in the country were within like one mile from a COVID, distribution, uh, COVID vaccine distribution center, uh, which was amazing. Um, I think that when we looked at Donald Trump's response under COVID, I think it was an unmitigated failure. He wasn't a leader. He denied it was a problem for so long. He had an inability to, to get people to come together to create PPE. Um, he had fightings all over his administration. Uh, there was no coordinated uh, national level response for how things should be handled. Instead, it was done state by state, um, which was a fucking disaster. And we can even see when we look into the red districts, the districts that voted for Trump and the districts that voted for Biden, the ones that had the higher fatality rate, the ones that dealt with more COVID uh, uh, that, that dealt with more COVID issues, all of them were states that voted for Trump. And the go-to excuse is always, well, those people are older, which by the way is more of a reason for them to be more stringent, but also when you adjusted for age, they still had higher fatality rates because they weren't getting vaccinated and they weren't enacting any of the measures that would have kept them safe from any disease transaction. So I think when, and then look at the George Floyd riots. I mean, well, I mean, what was it? We had some federal police that were arresting people in some states. We had Donald Trump stoking the flames. Look at January 6th, right? You had Donald Trump with the ability to shut that down at any point in time stewing on his fucking bed, probably watching reruns of, of Good Morning America or whatever in his fucking bathrobe. Um, Donald Trump has not been a leader on any of the crises that have occurred in the United States ever. He hasn't been a leader in any uh, international crises that's occurred ever. Uh, he's just a fucking loser. I don't know what to say. Yeah. So first of all, Trump, I'll have you know, was in the beast reaching for the steering wheel, according to the reports during January 6th. All right. And you had a follow-up there? Uh, no. Uh, thank you for your answers. Thank you so much for your question. I mean, he cheated. He gave answers off topic. I'm just saying. All right, your next question. Yeah. So as the lone Republican Trump supporter here in the entire room, which I'm sure there's some people that didn't raise their hand, probably feel the same way, but they're just not there yet. Fine. Um, interested in engaging a hypothetical. Please. So somehow, some way, Biden is ruled medically incompetent. Pre-election, post-election, whatever. Now. That turns into Harris versus Trump. I'm sure you got a million things to say about that. I would like to hear them. But could you sell me on the idea of Harris if you had to? Uh, I, I would vote for uh, Terry Schiavo over Donald Trump. Um, just because of the type of administration the Democrats would back, like the general policies of the two administrations, the Republican Party, even if you're a Republican, you have to admit, the Republican Party is, is, is lost out to sea right now. They don't know who they are. Um, they don't know if it's a party that is fiercely allegiant to Donald Trump, uh, even if it means walking off a cliff. They don't know if they'll support other Republican leadership. Like, the Republican Party is, is, is just a collection of, of or not a collection of, but it's essentially like a schizophrenic, like wandering blind person in a forest trying to figure out, you know, where to set up camp. I, I truly don't know. I, I'm being a little bit mean, but I almost said that with, a, with the tiniest bit of compassion, but not much because you chose Donald Trump, so the deal with the devil that you made. But um, yeah, I, I wouldn't trust the Republican Party to do anything competently right now. What they, they can't even choose, a, uh, they, how long did it take for them to get a fucking speaker in the House? 
Like, this is an unprecedented failure in leadership, even with a majority in the House. Uh, I don't know how any Republican can look to the current Republican Party and think that, like, these are the people that I want to lead us. I, I just, I can't imagine. J just to engage, like, really quickly with that hypothetical, first of all, the Republicans are so good at getting a Speaker of the House. They actually got two in a single congressional session. That's pretty damn That's impressive. That's one way to look at it. Okay. Very efficient right there. Yeah, number number two. Honestly, if I were if I were a Republican, I would rather have a Kamala Harris presidency than a Joe Biden presidency because the one point that he made throughout this whole entire day that's dead on accurate is Biden is good at getting legislation done because he is a creature of the Senate. He has been there since it was formed. He watched the building get constructed and he knows how to legislate in a way that these younger politicians just don't. So like I personally, because Kamala Harris is more unlikable and worse at getting things done because she just doesn't have the experience in the Senate, it would be similar to Obama not being able to get that legislative achievement, would rather have Kamala uh, in the White House as an enemy of the person in power, if that makes sense. Excellent. All right, next question. So you brought up New York City when you were talking about like um, losing population, but to my understanding, the population drop was across cities in general across America, and the three largest cities that lost population were actually cities in red states. It was Jacksonville, Missouri, um, St. Louis, and then it was, I think it was some city in Utah. So why do we only talk about like blue state cities losing population when it's in fact a trend that seems to have occurred across cities across America as opposed to just concentrated in blue states? So I mean, first of all, I, in terms of cities losing population, I don't think that those are the top three, but I could be wrong, so I'll just... That's in percentage, Right. Totally. Sure. Uh, because I've seen, uh, like, I've done stories on this, and I, to be fair, I remember, like, a San Francisco and New York being in there, but I don't remember where they were on population versus percentage. So, like, you could be right. We can, we can just concede that point, like, right off the bat. Um, certain cities that are losing population, they may be in red states, but they may also be blue cities. Now, I don't know about the city in Utah. Um, it could be Salt Lake City, which I would think is more reddish city or whatever, but that's not the point. So the reason people talk about cities in terms of their government um, and like the loss of population is because typically the cities enacted the policies that presumably drove people out, not the state. Like if you're leaving, um, if you're leaving Houston, it's probably due to policies enacted by the city of Houston, especially if the state of Texas overall is uh, gaining population. Now, New York State also was losing population because they were leaving not just the city, but they were leaving the state. California as a whole was losing population because they weren't just leaving San Francisco or Los Angeles, they were leaving the state. So like, there may be like different cities that people were fleeing due to, you know, like their jobs became remote and then they decided to want to live wherever they wanted. Sure, but like overall, when we talk about the impact of policy, it seems to be disproportionate in blue cities or blue states, especially when it comes to COVID policy. How do we know that people were leaving the cities because of like bad liberal policy versus them leaving just because like housing is getting more expensive? I mean, they were already living there that whole time and then they just decided to up and leave when the lockdowns went down. And I'm sure there's like exit surveys that you can look at that would like, why are you leaving this place? And I'm sure it's a mix, it's a mix of different things, but. Well, yeah, but then like, are, are you, so you're saying that the trend of people leaving cities was done solely because of COVID lockdown so policies? No, I didn't say, so, but did I, did I not just say that there would be a multiple of reasons and like well, so there would be- Well, so when I ask, why do you think people are leaving cities and so, you give COVID policy, you're either okay. saying that's the primary reason or the only reason. I think so it's, I'm saying, so I think it's a huge reason, but why do you, like- Hold on, you always how, use wizard. When you say housing, huge reason, housing, what does that mean? So but, is it the biggest reason? But or? housing affordability would depend on the circumstances. So a lot of people left Silicon Valley and they went to Mexico City uh, and that was specifically because it was cheaper. So probably for them, it was housing. Sure, but, so let's do a comparison. Do you think more people left cities because of COVID policies or because of the cost of housing? Uh, I think it was because of COVID policies overall, especially if you factor in the fact that they couldn't go into work, so they didn't have to be there, they could work remote. Okay, and if that trend is continued into today of people moving out of cities, do you think they're moving out of cities because they're traumatized by COVID policies, or do you think it's the cost of housing? I mean, they might have already moved on with their lives in their, in their new state. Like, the people who left New York State aren't returning now that the policies are being reversed, so they might have settled wherever they well, wanted. Well, you said New York State, you meant New York City, because you were York talking City about City policies, New York City and New York State are losing population. Okay. Which would lead it to not be technically probably about housing prices, because housing prices in overall New York State are pretty low, but if they're moving all the way to Florida, it might be due to the policies of the state and or city. All right, 
Smile, Ozian. You're on camera. There you go. Your question. I just want to correct something about the civil asset for forfeiture that Destiny asked about. It, it the law allowed the government to collect the federal government to collect up to eighty percent of that money, which creates a problem for recovering the losses. But my question is, I can foresee a scenario where Trump is in prison in Georgia, and Georgia doesn't have to pardon him, so he can go sit in, I don't know what that will create, some type of constitutional crisis there. And Biden becomes unable to run, and then you got a third party candidate. you got RFK Jr. that's declared, and the race currently is polling between 14 and 20 percent. I don't personally support him. You should so you should vote Libertarian Party, by the way. Anyways, what do you think about this scenario? Is there a potential for RFK Jr. to become president? And if so, what do you think that would mean? Listen, I, I put RFK Jr. in the same camp that I put um, Andrew Yang, Tulsi Gabbard, and all the candidates of that ilk. They're running for president of the internet, and our constitution actually bars them from being president in two offices at the same time. So I don't consider them like legitimate candidates. As for this idea that Biden's going to be declared mentally incompetent to run for president, it's not going to happen. If he's alive, he's running. The guy's wanted to be president since like 1848 when he first started running for president. Like he's spent his whole career in politics. In real terms, he's been in the Senate since he was 30. This has always been a goal uh, in his life. And and the fact of the matter is, like, I can joke amongst this, like, politically literate crowd about Biden basically being a dead person, but your average everyday American does not know that. Like, they're not watching Twitter videos of him fumbling words or anything like that. So not only does is he going to run, but he's probably the Democrats' best candidate as of right now to run. All right, next question. All right, uh, Sean. I understand this is mostly Biden or Trump, but is there another Republican or conservative candidate you would probably put higher than Trump? I know that he asked about RFK, or and you mentioned Tulsi Gabbard, but there's plenty of other Republican candidates, DeSantis and so on. Even Ted Cruz has tried running and mentioned it a few times. So would you consider any of the other Republican candidates higher than Trump? And I'd also like to say thanks to everyone for coming. Yeah. So this thanks is for coming to Dallas. And last bit, Obama. <laughs> Obama. <laughs> So this is, a, this is a good question. If I had, like, first of all, like Trump's going to win the primary. Like, like I'm 98% sure. Uh, if I had to pick somebody that I would prefer to be the president uh, based on most of their policies, it would be somebody like Governor Ron DeSantis, who's effective at governing. So like one of the things that I was so impressed by, uh, and because we did, just don't do this in America, is when whatever hurricane or whatever the hell hit, um, Florida, there was a bridge that got torn down in the Keys, and that bridge got rebuilt in three days. We don't build anything in the United States of America in three days. We actually have to go through three years of environmental impact studies just to decide whether or not it's going to hurt the turtles too much to build it. So as a more effective governor, like in terms of governing, not just being a governor of Florida, uh, I would think Ron DeSantis is better at task, at being a better taskmaster. Or her, but I don't think that um, I, I don't I don't think that he's a better candidate. And honestly, him signing that six week abortion ban or whatever, like he didn't have to do that. And I think that sunk him on a national level, even if he did win the primary. So he, he kind of destroyed himself nationally. All right. Next question. Yeah. So I noticed that a lot of this debate um, was about like the previous track records for each administration, which like fair. But I was curious about more so the take of um, Looking forward um, to like 2024 and and beyond, to like I mean Trump has announced things that he wants to do, part of his platform for 2024, Project 2025, etc. So um, yeah, I'd just like to hear you make an argument for what you think Trump would be doing that would be better for America and the world, and then Destiny, maybe if you could like shit on his answer. Thank you. Well, I, th I think the reason we talk talked about framing. past record is because past behavior is a good predictor of future results. And like a lot of the stuff that the Trump campaign is announcing, like how we're going to re-examine birthright citizenship under the 14th Amendment, is stuff that he announced during the last Trump campaign and a year into his presidency and two years into his presidency and three years into his presidency. And then in like the last couple of months of his presidency before the election, he was like, I'm gonna re-examine this. So like whatever he's promising right now on the campaign trail, like I, I would rather trust how he acted in office 
and the things that he did and basically letting his the people that he appointed craft policy in those realms rather than what he says on the surface. Um, yeah, I just, um, Donald Trump was just horrible in, in almost every conceivable way. And in some ways that are kind of like important to me, like even as an American, even as somebody that used to be conservative, um, I can't imagine electing a president that said that like he would consider suspending the Constitution because he's asked Matt about the last election results. That's an unfathomable statement. If any person, even tangentially related to the conservative party, or I'm sorry, to the Democratic Party would have made any state, like if Hillary Clinton's like daughter-in-law would have made a statement like that, I feel like conservatives would be screaming it from the rooftop for you know the next like 10 years. Um, and the fact that Donald Trump himself said that on social media is insane. Uh, it, as much of a meme as it is, I think in a way the president is kind of like the American international cheerleader and domestically is supposed to be the guy that brings us all together. There has never been been, um, at least in my history, like a president as divisive as Trump, somebody that's as embarrassing on the world stage to talk about. Um, yeah, I just think in, in, in every conceivable way, like even independent, his agendas, which are horrible. Um, yeah, I, I just I, I wouldn't want him leading my nation at all. Like it's it's an embarrassment, I think, to the United States. And just to fact check you, uh, Hillary Clinton would have a son in law. Her daughter's also not a lesbian. Uh, OK. Oh, Hillary Clinton would have a son in law. Gotcha. Oh. Also, as another minor fact check, I can't find literally anything that says that COVID policies were a reason why people left the cities. I know there's a big mean conservative said, but I don't think there's a single data point that shows that at any point whatsoever. But. Yeah, very we'll next question. Up. You've mentioned Biden's cognitive decline, which I mean, I guess fair enough, he's like 108. Um, but I've seen Trump in action, as have other folks here in the audience, and I can't necessarily speak for everyone, but I think there would probably be consensus that the guy's a few fries short of a happy meal. And I wanted to know how you felt about that and whether or not you disagree or yeah. that. Uh, hungry. I mean, yeah, you know, I mean, Trump does like fast food a lot, um, yeah. but to go with, <laughs> yeah, to move off the analogy. Uh, yes, there is a slowing down of Trump. You, like the benefit of these guys is you can watch them on tape. There is a slowing down of Trump from his younger years. Like he talks with a little bit faster pace and all that in his youth, but more or less, it's the same person. There's a huge decline. And I invite anybody to watch uh, Paul Ryan versus Joe Biden in that debate between Joe Biden then and Joe Biden now, at least in terms of his ability to speak. Now, whether that's because he's losing cognitive ability and thus his ability to manage his stutter, or there's legitimate like mental like decline that we should be concerned about is honestly completely irrelevant because again, most of the American population doesn't watch these clips of Biden. So like, like I said, it's noticeable, you notice it, but I also added that this is not going to affect his electoral prospects at all, in my opinion. In fact, him not speaking so much because he doesn't want people to see this might help him because Trump's gonna be on the campaign and put all the focus on him. It worked the last time anyway. All right, we're gonna close there. Uh, so a big round of virtual applause for the people that are watching online and a big round of in-house applause for our fantastic speakers here. We are going to close with the poll that we started at the beginning. So I'm gonna hand the boss uh, the mic here and away we go. Thanks, Ryan. Wow, that was, I am so excited. That was fantastic, thank you guys. So if you would say that, as we started before, Biden is better for America's future, Slip your hand up. Hold on a dang second there. <laughs> no, okay, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Let me get my glasses on. You're just gonna have to hold your hands in the air for a hot second. And if you're watching online, wanna let you know, folks, you can check out the Manifold link in the description box right now. It's not too late. You can still vote on who you think will be most persuasive in this debate. Click on that Manifold link in the description box right now. Manifold is the play money prediction market where you can bet on virtually anything. So check it out as this debate, or I should say the outcome of the debate, as you can see with the live updated screen in the picture. We will take our next vote, which is, if you think that Trump would be better for America's future, please slip your hand up. By the way, that was, uh, that was a nice move when you named the categories and all that. Like, I should have known it's always um, healthcare at the top of it. Oh, I'm with just all saying. These programs. Well, it's a good listen, move. Like, <laughs> they shouldn't. Uh, 
They should make more money then. That, you know? I really actually should have left at, at that point. Yeah. But yeah, it always is healthcare. I'm, I am telling you in all seriousness, the military bases are disproportionate. No, it's just true. I don't believe it. I don't believe Listen, it. Listen, there is obviously healthcare is the number one. I mean, also, our, if you're watching online, budget, don't forget like to hit subscribe as we'll have future I, I, conferences, I mean, including that, Debate so Con 5 in 2024. Yeah. Red states are going to be a bigger dream because blue states tend to have the more I economically didn't, prosperous. I didn't dispute that overall. I'm just saying the, there's a oh, dramatic God. exaggeration of it this, before we based on military spending. <clears throat> Excellent. Well, uh, in the first poll, we had 95% of the room in favor for Biden. At the end, we had 90% in favor of Biden. Wait, was that a decline? So that is... No, 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 just keep the percentage. I won over the crowd. So, in your face, Stephen! So, so an extra 5% in favor of Trump in Ooh. the room, given our in-house poll. Against me. I just swung the whole country. Nice. There we Listen, 50,000 votes in three states. If I can pull one person right there, <laughs> That's true. it's over there we go. for you. Nebraska Steve, you're done. Anything else you want to say there? He wasn't in the room for the first <laughs> Thanks so much, folks, for coming. And I want to let you know... We really do appreciate you being here. It means more than you know. And stick around. Love to get to meet you. If you got to go, it's okay. Drive safe if you have to go. But I want to say a couple of huge thank yous. First, of course, really do appreciate you guys again. We appreciate the speakers for getting in the hot seat and doing these debates. Like, it's been fantastic. So I'm so encouraged. Just the, the high quality of these debates was just fantastic. So enjoyable. And also want to say, though, there are so many people, volunteers, like Chris is in the back. Chris, can you put your hand up? Thank you, Chris. I, it's uh, uh, guys that say, hey, you know, like, we'd love to do this. Like, we just think it's fun. And so uh, Ryan as well. Thanks so much, Ryan. He is from. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> but. Uh, Brian, he had to leave already, but we have so many people. And also, I want to say a huge thank you to Manifold. Steven, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for your support of DebateCon 4. Thank you very much. And folks, Manifold is linked in the description box. Check out Manifold, and we'll let you guys go. Thanks so much. I hope I get to meet you. Have a good night. That's the percentage of their budget. Like you have Vermont, which, is, which came in the most in 2020. And your lease is like Colorado, which is purple.